This is Jocko Podcast number 313 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. He looks like any other ordinary young Afghan. A dusting of a dark beard, sun-leathered face, a small child clinging to his side. Only Nazifullah, 24, is a proud member of Afghan's ISIS affiliate known as ISIS-K or informally as Dash. He has long been wanted by everyone from US troops and the now defunct Afghan security forces and the Taliban, formerly known as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Nasfula says he joined the terrorist group around five years ago out of frustration that the Taliban was dishonest about the status of its shadowy leader. We kept asking the Taliban to show us video of Mullah Omar, but we couldn't get any, he claims. That is why the dash here was created. They seemed truthful and said they were going to implement Sharia law, so that is why I joined them. Taliban founder Omar died in 2013, yet it was kept secret for more than two years. Most ISIS-K recruits are believed to have defected from Taliban branches in Afghanistan and neighboring Pakistan, seeking an even more extreme interpretation of Islam with more international rather than domestic-centered goals of caliphate control. Since then, the terrorist outfit has attracted a wealth of foreign recruits bent on attacking NATO, Afghan forces, and the insurgency-turned-Taliban government. Since the emirate came to power on August 15th, ISIS-K has waged a deadly spat of suicide attacks and targeted bombings across multiple provinces and claimed dozens of lives. While some assaults have targeted the Taliban, the vast majority have been inflicted upon innocent civilians, particularly the minority Shiite population. Nazifullah says he is unclear how many ISIS-K members are hidden in, inside Afghanistan. He spent the last year locked away in the country's notorious Bagram prison, having been arrested by the previous Afghan government for his ISIS membership. However, when the Taliban swept to power in August, he says he was released, even though the new regime was aware of his checkered past. Nazifullah went straight back to the black-clad terror clan, but says he has since broken his leg, seemingly from an accidental discharge from his own rifle. Yet he remains ready to take up arms again with a very specific goal in mind. Our first target is to destroy Pakistan because the main reason for everything in Afghanistan is Pakistan, he vows. When the Taliban were here, they were saying that we control 80% of the country, but they were not implementing Islamic rulings. That's why we stood up in when we started ISIS-K over in this area. Nasfula continues that in the parcel under their dominance, the outfit immediately began, quote, implementing Islamic rulings like cutting hands and everything. So that's when the Taliban got funding from Pakistan and started fighting us back, he claims with a big smile. And at that time, Baghdadi announced the caliphate in our area and we were on top. That's why we are against the Taliban. Although Nazifullah asserts that his outlawed group is, quote, weak now and attempts to downplay their lethality, their hardline goals remain firmly in place. We want to implement Sharia law. We want to implement the way our prophet was living, the way he was clothed, the dressing hijab was there. Currently, we don't have much to fight, but if you give me anything, I am going to fight Pakistan now. Yet hauntingly, Nazafula also makes it clear that ISIS-K has far more global reaching ambitions. Whoever goes against Islam and against the Quran, he adds darkly, we are against them. (laughs) 
And that is an article from knews.com. The article is written by Holly McKay. Holly is a journalist. She's an author. She's a war reporter. And she is an extremely courageous human being. She's been on this podcast before, number 271, where she talked about her experiences in the war against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, which she chronicled in her incredible book, which is called Only Cry for the Living. And she's back with us again tonight to share with us her experiences from Afghanistan. Because she was there, she was there during the American departure, the collapse of the government, and the rise to power and control of the Taliban. So Holly, welcome back, and I do mean that sincerely. I was watching through social media when you were in Afghanistan, and I was terribly worried about you. And we'll discuss why, I'm sure we'll get to some of that. It was definitely sketchy to say the least. But for now, I am truly glad that you are here and you went there for a reason, to learn, to capture what was happening, and you've done that. So let's talk about let's talk about what you've been through. First of all, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's <sighs> strange adjusting. So it's been mm. a few days, and I'm still getting used to no, you know, a highway without bombed and potholes. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is a nice road. Hang on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to set the stage a little bit. To, to bring you into Afghanistan when you went back, when you went to Afghanistan this time, just to get where what you stepped into. July 2nd, Germany and Italy withdraw from Afghanistan. That is the same time that America quietly and strangely left Bagram Air Base. Mm-hmm. July 8th, Biden announces that the war is gonna be over and we're gonna be out by August 31st. July 12th, General Miller, who is the commander uh, commander of U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan, he steps down. And by the way, this is right as Taliban is seizing district after district. By mid-July, they had seized you know 140 or 150 districts inside of Afghanistan. July 21st, General Milley reports that half the districts in Afghanistan are under Taliban control. So July 22nd, the US House of Representatives, they they pass a bill for visas for our interpreters and and other allies that were there. And the reason I bring that up is because that turned into a big deal as everything shut down. And so that's what we're going into. It's very obvious, and I forget the quote from General Milley, but it was something along the lines of everyone was surprised at how fast it was collapsing, but it was collapsing quick. So August 7th is when you arrive in Kabul. What was your purpose in going there? Did you did you know how fast it was falling down? Did you like, hey, this isn't gonna make it, I'm gonna go in there anyways? What was that, what was the thought process there? So I made the decision, I think it was around May, June, that I was going to go back in August uh, with my uh, photographer, Jake, who's Australian, who's also spent a lot of time, he lived in Afghanistan and spent a lot of time in, in other places. So we thought we would go back and document what I thought was going to be the the last month of the Americans being there and then the Afghan government trying to stand on its own two feet. So between making that decision and what happened it just you couldn't you could i just i did not realize it was going to happen that quickly and so when i arrived even that first week i was going to meetings at nds which is the afghan intelligence i was going to meet with all these different people and everybody was just so convinced that it wasn't going to fall immediately at least not within say that month and it's so the speed of it and, I, and I've had to do so much reflection on this and looking back and going where did you miscalculate how did this sort of happen so quickly and it really just goes to show I think nobody really had any idea at the end of the day I think there were there were sort of intelligence failures on many different levels from many different from parts of it I've talked about some of this um, if I'm a company commander 
Mm. and I'm in charge of training Afghan forces. I want to do a good job. And when I report to my battalion commander and I, you know, the first I'm working with these guys for a month and, you know, he says, how are those guys? And I say, well, they got some work to do. They're, they're not that great. They're deficient here. They're deficient there. They're not good at this. And my battalion goes, commander says, okay, well, you know, get them squared away. The next month, what do I say? You know, I'm, I'm going to tend to say, yeah, well, we're making some improvements. We're, we're doing a little bit better. We've got them issued better gear. We, we got the supply issues taken care of that we were worried about. We did a, a live fire training operation. And, and so you end up just by virtue of having a positive attitude, which Americans certainly have, we end up painting a better picture than what is actually happening. I, I saw this, I, I, I try to think if I did this, I believe I did. I believe that I did in training Iraqi forces would sometimes say, what, you know, um, I would put some lipstick on, on, on the situation a little bit. Again, trying to have a positive attitude, trying to look at the brightest side of what was happening. And, and there was times in, in Iraq where the Iraqis would take over a position and the insurgents would immediately attack it and crush them. And so we got put in check a few times. <clears throat> I would almost say luckily, because that, what that caused us to do was to be very honest about the capabilities of the people we were working with. So there is actual times where the Iraqis would take over, let's say, a, a checkpoint. We'd say, yep, they're good to go. And this is when I say we, I mean coalition forces in general. You know, the Americans that are there said, yes, we've been working with these Iraqis. They can handle this checkpoint. We'd step away from the checkpoint. And this happened almost immediately upon my arrival. This checkpoint got taken over by the Iraqis and the insurgents attacked it a day later, or two days later. They killed the American advisor that was there. Actually, two American advisors that were there overran. It was total disaster. And that happened when I first showed up. So it really put us in check in terms of, okay, what do we need to be very cautious about what we report up the chain of command and when they're actually ready. But at the same time, you know, I, my guess is, and even when we left Iraq, I was very worried. I was very worried when America left Iraq, when coalition forces left Iraq, I thought to myself, they, they can't, they're not ready yet. And there's a, there's a similar, obvious similar theme here. So almost every, I never fought in Iraq, in, in Afghanistan, but everyone that I know that worked on the ground with the Afghan forces, we're all not surprised. Hey, they weren't ready yet. They just weren't ready yet. And it's a huge, it's, it's, um, it's almost like when you have these, these elements, the US support is really like the long pole in the tent. And all the other t tent poles and the canvas that goes over the tent is, and the stakes that go on the ground, all those things are really, really important. And you can build those up and you can make them really good and you can, they can provide you shelter from the rain and shelter from the wind. But if you pull out that one long pole in the middle, it has a huge negative impact. Mm -hmm. And and that's sort of, again, in hindsight, yeah. as I look at it, that's, what, that's one of the things I think happened. Yeah, I think there were just multiple things. I think even right down to the number of ghost soldiers. So on paper, there might be 300,000 Afghan soldiers when there's in reality there's a, a quarter of that because people would take commanders were taking money of people that never existed or they were dead or there was no accountability um you know i can i can go into corruption for days in in how that really destroyed afghanistan and so to drill into that corruption that you just talked let me let me see if i got this little piece of it right, right. i'm a commander i'm a i'm an afghan commander if i say i have 500 soldiers i get x amount of money yep so guess how many I have? 700. <laughs> and, and, and two of you guys die, you're not going to report that because no. you mm. still want to keep getting their money to the point where they would take the bank cards of the dead soldiers and go to the bank and get them their paychecks every week or every month. Like it, it, it's the level, and we can get into this, but in my, I have never seen a more corrupt place on every possible level. And yet... You know, we and when I say we, I say the United States. We turned a blind eye to that for for really twenty years. Instead of going to the root and fixing it, we let it fester and create this entire 
industry of corruption, which is what the Taliban was not only able to capitalize on, but they came in saying, well, we're not going to be corrupt. And people that don't even like the Taliban's were so fed up with that corruption that they were going to support that even if they didn't support the ideology. So you get there on the 7th, the 8th and 9th, you're meeting with intel people. It's still not clear that this thing is going to fall apart or you or is it yeah, starting to look that I think there way? was this idea of well Kabul was never going to fall. And certain pockets like Kabul, Pangaea, you know, even Mazar, which is where I ended up, these were very very staunch resistance places and there was sort of this idea that how can they possibly fall? And so I, I met with and I had actually stayed with him in 2018 in Ankara was General Dostum. So General Dostum was the, the warlord, I guess, who the U.S. troops first went in with from the north during um, after the 9-11. And that's where Mike Spann was killed and sort of the first people there. So I'd met him several years ago um, in Turkey and, and did a profile with him. And so he invited me to go back to Mazar because he was leading some resistance forces there that were working with the Afghan commandos. And... Yeah, it was just sort of this idea, and I, I guess looking back, it was you know selling a story that didn't exist. But we decided, okay, well, let's go and cover what's happening in Mazar, even though the northern provinces surrounding it were all sort of falling. There was this sense that Mazar was going to hold, so we went to Mazar. It was uh, very early on a Thursday morning. How'd you get up there? We flew. Okay. Yeah, came air, and so it's about a fifty-minute flight from Kabul to Mazar, and so. We did get you there. say? Did you say a fifty-minute flight? Yeah, fifty-minute flight. And was this who? Who's who's flying the helicopters? Is this just charter? This is a commercial airline. Just a commercial yeah, airline. Yeah, yeah. I flew a commercial airline two weeks ago, mm-hmm. so they still exist. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad to land that one because there was no landing lights. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but they're still a commercial airline, so we flew to Mazar because at this point you couldn't travel on roads anywhere, which is an something else that's changed significantly now but but then you couldn't you that you could the taliban had really cut off every strategic road and you couldn't go much beyond sort of Kabul, maybe Kabul to Pangaea, but that was a, sort of the most road travel you could do so we flew to mazar that was really early in the thursday morning and you get there and it was just this incredibly vibrant place and i just remember it was the how how is there how are all these provinces around this place falling to the Taliban when the markets were just chock-a-block and everybody is just going about their daily business? I, just, I was flabbergasted. And I thought, isn't, like, what is happening? And you'd go and sort of talk to people and they'd be, oh, I'm a little bit worried, but it's okay. I think it'll be okay. We'll just flee to Kabul. Um, so that was the Thursday. And everything, yeah, seemed and, very normal. Yeah, so your feeling was, okay, well, Obviously, yeah. this is going to be okay. Yeah, and and I, you know, had a couple of friends who were very worried about me being in Mazar, and I, I was sort of like, it seems fine to me. Um, but but what did really struck me as as weird was that there was no police, there was no military presence on the street at all. Mm. I didn't see a single like Afghan forces come through, and I I thought that was strange. I thought, where is where is this? Like, this is city. This is in the middle of a, a firestorm here, and there is zero security forces right now. So that struck me as strange. But everybody was going about life. And then the next day, Friday, which is the weekend day in Afghanistan, but still things were out. And I was going out interviewing people, just asking them how they felt, people in the markets. And people were starting to feel really worried. They said, well, you know, we think it's going to fall, but we just don't know when it's going to happen. And as the day progressed, you felt it get a little bit, people were becoming more tense. And we'd go to this, there's a beautiful big blue mosque, a big shrine there that's that's quite famous. And there were just a lot of people that had fled from other villages and other provinces. And they were all sort of hanging out outside this mosque. And, and by the evening, things were still happening. But I, you know, I said to Jake, my photographer, hey, okay, we need to book this return flight back to Kabul. And so I get online and I'm like, the earliest flight we can get is Monday night. And I was like, I, I think it's, you know, I called a few people. I was like, is it going to hold? Um, and they were like, yeah, you know, you should be fine. But but get out on the next flight you can get back to, to Kabul. And so I, I booked the flight. 
So you're online booking a flight, which means you're online watching news and seeing updates yeah. from other things. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's still, you got the impression, because tr- I don't remember exactly, I knew that you were in Mazar through social media, because yeah. you're, you're like posting about this stuff. Yeah. Um, but I also remember seeing, you know, sort of the battle map of what's happening and seeing the various providence, provinces collapse around. Mm, mm. And I just remember thinking, get, please get out of there. Mm. So, yeah, and I remember thinking that too. And I thought that this, is, this, this doesn't feel right. But that night we went out with the commandos, the Afghan commandos too. And they were taking a lot of hits and a lot of, you know, a lot of fighting. But... They were such extraordinary, and again, you know, this this perhaps warped my thinking a little bit too, but you had these men who were just like, we will never give this up. They will never get Mazar. We will, you know, and, and defend it and hold it, and just really great young men. And I, we stayed out with them until we about 2 o'clock that morning, and there was this sort of strange sense with, with one of them. His name was Safi, and, and he kept... You could tell how much he missed the West. He wanted us to stay and drink beer with him and, and listen to music. And he just, he didn't want us to leave. He just, he wanted, he wanted this sense of this connection to, to the West that I think that, you know, being trained by the Americans and just have this sort of deep love. Um, so two o'clock came, we got the guys to take us back to our hotel and we we're supposed to go out with them again at around seven or eight that morning. So we wake up on the Saturday and I'm waiting for a call from him. He's not there. He's not answering his phone. And I thought, you know, God, I hope he's okay. This is strange. I don't know what to do, but I will just wait for him to contact me again. Um, And then we thought, well, let's go out and do some stories. And we tried to contact some fixers or interpreters that we had known lived there. Everyone had fled to Kabul. We could not find anybody. Eventually, by mid-morning, we found somebody who knew somebody who said that he could he could come and be an interpreter if we did some interviews. And so we went out, and it was just suddenly this ghost town. From this, it had gone from extremely vibrant you know place to this complete ghost town. You just saw people lining up outside banks, just trying to get their money out. Um, and we're walking, and people are just fleeing from the outside villages into Mazar on those little rickshaws and, you know, with all their stuff. And and we met with this interpreter and we get into a, a cab and we're driving out toward, there was three front lines. And the interpreter, who I didn't really know too well, um, is on the phone as we're driving. And it's about midday. And he suddenly he looks at me and he turns around and he's got this big smile on his face. And he says, oh, they just broke through the, the first of the three lines and it's surrounded. And we looked at each other and, and the cab driver's like, I'm really scared because we're sort of driving toward it. And I said, OK, that's fine. We'll, we'll turn around and go back. It's n- no big deal. Um, so we went back and I went. Well, you had this detail that you just gave, yeah. which was he was smiling. Yeah, he was, and I still can't figure out <laughs> why he was smiling if he just didn't care or if he was a Taliban or if he just was trying to appease me or, so or like I wasn't he thought, worried. He thought, hey, I'm getting to get you some stories. They just yeah. broke through. Here yeah, we go. Yeah, and he's sitting there on the phone. He's like, turns around and it's just this, they just broke through the first. And and I'm like, okay. Um, so I get back to the hotel and I'm trying to make some phone calls because like, there's no there's no flight out that I can get earlier than that Monday. And there's no way it can, you know, it's a 10 hour drive, but there's no way I could even attempt to do that drive because it's all Taliban controlled. And so I'm making some calls to, you know, again, to my Intel contacts in Kabul. And even then they're saying, no, 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 it, it should hold. It'll hold. Don't worry. Um, and I was starting to get pretty worried and I was distracting myself, you know, doing some work and things. And then and then we normally go to this, there was a kebab cafe that we'd always go to each night. And it was a really lively place. It was underground. They would play these terrible soap operas, but there was always like a lot of people there playing music. And so Jake and I said, okay, well, let's go to this kebab cafe. And we step out and it's just pitch black and not a single person around. And I'm still figuring out, we walk to this kebab cafe and it's open. We're like, oh, it's open. And we go downstairs and the TV is off. And there's just these the two guys that work there that are just sitting there. And we order food and we're sitting there and then we just look at each other and we're like, something is really, really wrong. We need to go. And so we get up and we start hurrying back toward the hotel. And this was early evening, around seven. And then you just see those motorcycles coming in and that's the Taliban. 
And so we sort of hurry back just in time to get to our hotel and go to the roof. And I'm just looking out and the Taliban is just circling. <laughs> There's just hundreds of them and they're shooting in the air and they're playing their nasheed, which is their religious music and, and celebrating that they just took a city without firing a shot, basically. Um, but what also struck me during the day, and that was the other bizarre thing, I thought, here is a city that's falling and there was no air power. There was not a sound in the air. And I remember that something, and I, I did a little video about it. I was like, where is the air power? Didn't we train? Didn't we put just tens, hundreds of millions of dollars into this Afghan air force? Where the hell is it? Because I don't hear it. And, and air power is a great example of the long pole in the tent, right? Mm -hmm. the, if you have air power, when the Taliban's coming in on their motorcycles and in their trucks, it, it, they can't. Yep. They literally can't do it. And that's the long pole in the tent that falls apart when that happens. You know, it's um, as you were talking about, like the talking to one of the Afghan soldiers that you knew and how he, you know, hey, we're going to stay here. We're going to fight. They'll never take us. Do you remember all that stuff that happened up in Portland when the Antifa took over the part of the yep. part of the neighborhood or whatever they were calling it? I think it was originally called CHOP. And then they changed it to Chaz, yeah, but it was the yeah. occupied zone or something like this. But somebody was asking me about it. And I kind of said, hey, there's no one up there in the chop that's like ready to die for the cause. That's ready to say, you know what? We're going to stay here. We're ready. They're just not, they're just not up there. There's no, I mean, America, and I kind of made the comment that, hey, even the people that are Antifa members, Guess what? They have cell phones and they have, you know, like nice, they have clothing and they have running water and it's just not that bad of a thing. And they're not right that committed to it. And it's, it's interesting when you think about what it really takes for someone to stand up and be willing to sacrifice themselves for a cause, whatever that cause is. And when you look at the Taliban and you, you're this Afghan person that's been fighting for however many years, and you've been fighting for the Americans. You've been fighting for the Afghan government for 10 years or seven years. And then you're like, well, it looks like we're completely surrounded. If I fight, I'm gonna die, or I can just kind of put down my weapon, take off my uniform and carry on with my life. And I, yeah, and you that know? was, you know, I, and I think it was sort of the next day, well, Joe Biden came out and said, you know, these guys ran away from their posts and things. And, and to a degree, I understand where that came from. But it actually, it, it upset me because they were really sold out by their leadership. And and I'll give you examples. So Safi, the guy that I'd met that Friday when I was finally able to get back in contact with him after Mazar had fallen and I asked him, are you okay? Where are you? And he said, you know, he'd gone out that day and, and they just, they were so outnumbered and his three bodyguards had been killed and... Um, you know, it was really the commandos that were trying to hold it. And he said by four o'clock that afternoon, somebody came to him and said, oh, Dustin left. And so did the commando left, like all oh, your commanders left. And it's up to you if you want to stay and die or you can leave. And he just, he, it, they were sold out yep. by everybody. I, I did hear stories um, from guys that I knew that said that the Taliban would like approach a village yep. and just send a messenger in there and be like, hey, you know, here's your chance. We know you were, you know, you, we know you were Afghan security. Um, you can put down your guns and be cool, yep. or we're gonna kill everyone. And guys were like, uh, okay, we're surrounded. We're gonna die. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we'll just, yeah, go back to the way it used to be. By the way, that's all, the other thing. It was they have sort of a lot of them had memory of what it used to be like, and it's like, okay, well, I guess we're going back the way it used to be. But it's better to do that, be alive, than be dead. Mm. And the amount of sacrifices that a lot of those Afghan soldiers made. I mean, they don't, they won't even release the number of killed, but mm. it's its well past 100,000. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there was at least 50,000 killed yeah. going into this whole thing taking place. Yeah. So it, it's not like, and, and again, there's plenty of Americans that fought alongside the Afghans and ha had met awesome Afghan troops, just like in Iraq, you know, there was, and by the time you were in Iraq, and the the Iraqis were fighting ISIS. They were f taking massive casualties, mm -hmm. massive casualties, going to take Mosul back. That was led by the Iraqi forces, and they took massive casualties, and they kept going. Compared to 
in in the Battle of Ramadi, the Iraqi forces were some of them were very scared and didn't want to take lead and definitely didn't want to take casualties. And we had whole battalions abandon and leave. So that idea of this kind of this kind of clear cut American version of the way things are is doesn't apply here. Yeah. There's no clear cut way of hey. Oh, if you get cap, if you're an American, you get captured. We know what's going to happen. You're going to get tortured. You're going to get killed. It's like, hey, you're an Afghan security force, and y- you surrender. You're not sure what's going to happen, but you know what's going to happen. If you don't surrender, you're going to die. So, and then you see your leadership all bail. running away, all running away, all of them, <clears throat> and every single one of them ran away, including the president, including the president, yeah, including the president who. <sighs> Yeah, with that guy, that is a is an insane situation. I mean, yeah. you have that guy, Ashraf Ghani, who <laughs> who is like a professor at Berkeley, a professor at Johns Hopkins, uh, went to some leadership school at Harvard, wrote the book called Fixing Failed States, which is like an academic exploration of this stuff, theoretical. It's an embarrassment. Yeah, and he bailed with a yeah. bunch of money, by the way. And and yeah, bunch of money is now under investigation. But what what I remember going back in being in Afghanistan in 2017, and sort of hearing when I'd go to the the NATO compound of the U.S. embassy, and everyone would say all these great things about Ghani, and I remember saying to a few people, "Have you gone out to the street just to talk to the Afghan people? Because they have a different idea, you know." So I think part of that problem was the U.S. because nobody was leaving that base in the diplomacy world. They were getting a vacuum of information that was pre-approved people to enter. They were all part of this sort of puppetry stream, and they weren't actually out there talking to the Afghans who were terribly frustrated with the corruption going on, terribly frustrated with the sort of, I guess, the the Pashtun and the sectarianism and, and things. And it just, the picture that was, was so warped compared to the reality that I saw even back then. And that was, so 2017, you're out talking to normal people mm-hmm. and they're totally frustrated with Ghani and yet the Americans are getting this whitewashed version yeah. of how, yeah. how he's doing an excellent job. Yeah. Um, when, so it was like August 14th. So Mazar falls, Kabul falls too. So that was the, so that was the Saturday night. So, you know, suddenly I'm like in the, in this room, in this hotel and, and the, the locals had all fled and there were no foreigners in there, except I think there was a guy from Tajikistan who, who was there for a couple of days and someone else. But so we, Jake and I look at each other and we said, well, what are we, what are we going to do? Um, you know, we're making some calls and I'm speaking to some some DOD people in Kabul and they said, well, you know, go and get us measurements, go and get us coordinates, go and get us this and that and we'll see if we can get you out in the morning, the early morning. And it was an interesting night. So you had, um, you had, you know, us trying to get all this information and then the morning and the, the Taliban's were out having a crazy, you know, Taliban party all night. Um, and so by the morning light, I thought, well, they'd gone to sleep then because they celebrated all night and they'd gone to sleep, but then you know, nobody's calling. Um, <laughs> they were just sort of looking at each other going, well, now is kind of the chance to get out in this uh, period where they're not in the street because they're going to be in the street in a couple of hours. Um, but it became very evident that just it wasn't going to happen. And then then that Sunday we started seeing news reports that the, that the Taliban were at the gates of Kabul and then the next thing you know, they're taking the palace and we just sort of I looked at I looked at Jake when that happened and I said whoa yeah we're pretty much <laughs> we've got to figure this out were you feeling were you feeling threatened with when the Taliban showed up so the images that they were portraying of the Taliban was a uh, <laughs> was like a, a kinder, gentler Taliban was coming in, right? It was right. like you said, it was it was like celebratory. Yeah. It didn't look like a angry mob. It looked like a happy mob that was celebrating and that that was sort of the images that we got initially. Then it quickly turned into images of people being people being killed, people being murdered. Mm-hmm. Um but what was your initial impression? My initial impression <clears throat> was 
it was just bizarre because they were the, it, 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 I was like, who are these barbarians in the street? Like, how is this? Like, and then they're doing announcements over the loudspeaker. And it was so strange because you saw this instant transformation of a, of a city. And, and they did, they did look a little, you know, intimidating. And there were just so many of them. And that was the thing. I thought, where did these people come from? Because Mazar was a very strong Taliban resistance place. And suddenly it's just, there's hundreds of them. And, I don't know where you they come from. And I, I sent Jake out to buy me a burger at the market and he just came back. He's like, oh my God, <laughs> they're just, they're crazy, you know? And so we were trying to, I guess, figure what out. What did he mean by crazy? He just like, they're, they're, they're just everywhere. Okay. And they just, you know, they, they literally have sort of the dominance of, of every corner possible in the city. And that was their strategy, I think, in the very beginning when they took places. They just flooded it with fighters to make sure that they could hold it. Now, a normal person would like concentrate on hiding and getting out of there, but you kind of focused on let's go interview people. So <laughs> not not quite. So I, I mean, at first I went a little quiet. I was like, I don't know. And I was trying to pretend to my parents I wasn't in the city because straight away my dad's like, we just heard on the news, Mazar's <coughs> fallen. Are you there? I said, no, I'm outside the city. <laughs> um, so I was trying to, yeah. To try to appease them a little bit, but uh, so I was a little unclear, and, and and what sort of had concerned me at that point was, I know that first night that they came in, and there was a bank underneath the hotel, so they were so the Taliban were desperately trying to get into the hotel where we were, and we knew that we were the only foreigners in there at that point, and. And these incredible hotel staff had stayed there for us. And they were terrified because they'd all been former NDS or previously worked in different capacities with the Afghans. And I knew that they were desperately wanting to, to go home to, you know, safety or flee or their families. But they really stayed there for us. And that was um, just something that I thought was just extraordinary. And it goes back to that Afghan hospitality and, and care. Um, so we were there um, and se- several days are going by and the focus was to get out, but it just, it became so, and I, my phone was just blowing up with so many different people telling me, do this, do this, do this. And I was just like, you all need to leave me alone at this point, <laughs> please, because it's not helping. Um, and I said to, you know, the US people that I was speaking to right from the beginning, I think the only way is you go and talk, to, like I need to go and talk to them to get their permission to leave because there really wasn't another way. There wasn't really a way that I felt that I could sneak out mm-hmm. or, you know, go under the radar. And yeah, that was that was what I was pushing for from the beginning. So that was sort of my focus in in doing that. So it falls on like the 14th, 15th and you spend the next few days trying to figure out what the best course of action is. And so what did you finally figure out? So, um, yeah, we I talked to, to so many different people and I thought, you know, any sort of rescue, any whatever is not going to happen. So I talked to a couple of diplomats and then I talked to um, sort of, I guess, a middle person who was a, a, a Afghan business guy. And so it was very, very quick. And then he sort of said, well, I'll come to the hotel um, and, you know, be ready at this time. And they teed some things up with the Uzbek consul, which was closed, but they were able to kind of get it open. So next thing you know, I'm dragging my stuff down and the two people that come to meet me is my drivers are the two Taliban elders, you know, the co- co- cousin of the, uh, his shadow governor turned new governor. So you see these sort of old Taliban guys and, and I'm getting into the car with them and they were like, welcome. It was so bizarre, Joko. It was, I was like, what? A uh, hi, um, because at that point we really didn't know. Well, it's I just guess you and Jake getting into this. Yeah, car? just Jake and I getting into the car with the Taliban, and we didn't know at that point, you know, how they were going to treat a foreigner, how they were going to treat a woman, how they were going to treat a journalist. Um, and so, yeah, they they drove us through the city, and I so I said, "Do you mind if I have a talk to you and ask you some questions?" And they said, "Sure," and. Um, you know, telling me about, I'm asking them about their, how they viewed Islamic law and Sharia law and what they wanted. And they just sort of said, well, you know, we want people's hands to be topped off when they steal. And if you murder, then you should be eye for an eye kind of thing. And, and telling me all about their, their rulings. And, um, but at the same time, they're like, yeah, you, you're welcome in Afghanistan. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. And, uh, we hope you enjoy our country. And it was very bizarre. And then we, 
were dropped off at the Uzbek consul and then suddenly these other Taliban's came um, and they were there's a group of them really young ones like in their early 20s and they were going to be our escort. And the only way sort of because we, we couldn't go back to Kabul was to go north to the Uzbek border. And so you had these bunch of these young Taliban's who were just who wanted to take selfies and, you know, continue to send. They continued to send long after that. My photographer, you know, selfies of themselves with, you know, Urdu music in the background and love heart emojis. <laughs> it was, it's literally the most bizarre thing you could imagine. I, I know. I was looking at pictures um, on some of your articles. You have yeah. pictures of these Taliban guys, like, with their iPhones or whatever, yeah. out there doing selfies. Yeah. It's the, freaking and for all social were, media. Yeah, and they and they harass, and, and I know with, there was a couple of other photographers that I know, and they harass poor Jake and, and the other photographers that get harassed for their photos. So if you take a picture of a Talamans, oh, I need your WhatsApp, I need your WhatsApp, and, get, and they, then they just harass, and they want pictures of themselves. Like, it's just, it's so new to them. These are people who are in hiding in the mountains for 20 years, and then suddenly... They're like out and free and kind of a spectacle. It's it's very bizarre. How does selfies and Instagram match up with Sharia law? I'm not sure about that one. I guess it's it's it's, it's too new for Sharia. Maybe. How does that work? They haven't put a ruling on it yet. Um, man, that's crazy. Um, so you were you at any point? At what point did you go? I think I'm going to be okay. Did the old Taliban make you feel that way? Did the young Taliban make you feel that way? I think, well, I, di- I did feel like I was going to be okay even when I was stuck in the hotel. I think the first night I was a little bit, well, you you had a, a normal sense of fear, I guess. I certainly, I didn't panic, but I, I was a little bit thrown. This wasn't in the plan. Um at all and but actually it's the small things that make you feel good i remember this this young man from the hotel came up to me and he said and he put the manager of the hotel on the phone to me the owner and the owner said to me don't worry i've already talked to the talibans and they promise not to enter the hotel and i thought that was just like christmas (laughs) it's like thank you and i just even though i didn't know whether that was true whether they were Mm going to honor that which they certainly weren't because they were trying to get in but it was like just what I needed to hear at that point to give me that sense of calm that I needed to to focus on on what it is I needed to do. Um, in Mazar, I saw I saw images and it was pretty prominent in in the news back here. Sort of as Kabul fell, like a let's say there was a, like a women's clothing boutique, mm. and then they show up the next day and it'd be gone, mm. or it'd be now whatever selling shovels or something like that. Did Mazar go through that really rapid transition from like? more western influence just to boom overnight all of a sudden yeah it was very overnight and mind you that was that was self-censorship that wasn't the taliban going around telling yeah. them they had yeah to that was me show. going oh yeah. you know i'm not going to be selling these yeah. women's freaking yeah. bikinis anymore we're shutting it down yeah yeah so it, yeah mazar really was just this drastic what, what i found fascinating was the the clothing transformation so you see people you know walking around in western jeans or whatever it is and then suddenly everybody's in afghan dress mm. and very very traditional um, and that was sort of the bizarre thing. And it took a couple of days before I saw a woman again on the street. And when I did, she was always in a burqa. Mm-hmm. So that was very, it, was, it, it really felt like you went from one civilization and then you just plunged back a, a couple of hundred years overnight. And even just, there were these messages coming out of the speakers, which I'd never heard before in Mazar either. So the same speakers that they used for the call to prayer were suddenly delivering messages you know, sort of town hall messages to people, you know, telling them that, um, you know, if anybody steals from them or anybody does anything, then they're to call this number or come to this place to report it. And so you have this immediate sense of the Taliban's trying to to govern suddenly. But yeah, it was so drastic, that, that transformation. So how do you get up to the Uzbek border? Just the, driving up there? The Taliban's. So the Taliban's took us. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so the Taliban's take us to the Uzbek border, which the Uzbek border is closed. But the, again, that the uh, you know some uh, a couple of really amazing diplomats in in Tashkent, which is the capital of Uzbekistan, had made arrangements with the Uzbek consulate to open the border, which I actually found out I didn't even need because both of us had Australian passports and we didn't need a visa for Uzbekistan, but Americans do. So. I could have gone anyway, I guess, but they had to open it specially for us because it was closed. Because the night before, when Mazar had fallen, or the, ni- the nights before, when Mazar had fallen, 
the, the soldiers flooded that border because oh. they had nowhere else to go. So they really flooded that border. And you, you drive along the way and you just see all the, you know, the American vehicles and the Humvees and everything just abandoned and left behind and the weapons still lying on the road and the, the you know, the fatigues. And, and these were just Afghan soldiers that were These were, were just fleeing. Afghan soldiers that were And they were, were going fleeing. for Uzbekistan. Yeah, because that was the closest route that they could go to get out. And so I think they let a certain amount in and then they just shut the border. How hard was it if I was a corporal or a private in the Afghan army and the Taliban's coming, how hard is it for me to be able to like take off my uniform, grab some traditional clothing and leave and get away with it? You wouldn't be able to get out of the country. I mean, they weren't taking anyone. And how about my identity as far as, hey, I'm just gonna go back to my home wherever in this village and just kind of take up life as a normal yeah. farmer or whatever. I mean, you could go and do that. I think eventually they'd track you down and not, and I think this was also a bit of a misnomer that happened in the beginning, was people were talking a lot, especially in the news, they were, oh, Taliban's got a list, they're coming to houses, they're getting you know, X, Y, Z, they're targeting so-and-so. And when I, I looked into it, they weren't really necessarily, and of course they're, some people, there are exceptions, but the, their overall goal wasn't necessarily to target any of these soldiers. Their goal was to take back government weapons. So any government vehicles, any government issued guns, they needed to take them back. So the process is when somebody surrenders, they get they hand over their weapon and they get given a letter from the Taliban. So the Taliban's give them a letter that basically says they've surrendered, this is their number, they're free to go. Um, so, you know, when Taliban's approach some of these soldiers, you know, they either have to show the letter and if they don't have the letter, then the Taliban's will want to know where their weapon is and, and, and what they're doing kind of thing. So, yeah, it was it, muddying. Okay, so you, now you're in Uzbekistan. You get there by, what, August 20th you're in a Uzbekistan? Yes, around, yeah, August 20th. So at this time, it's getting, cr- it's getting crazier in Afghanistan, you got Biden, and Biden is now on August twentieth makes his promise that all American citizens are going to be brought home. August twenty third, the CIA director William Burns meets with the leader of the Taliban, um, or one one of the leaders of the Taliban, well, co founder of the Taliban actually, to start talking about how we're going to withdraw. That starts to happen. The withdrawal starts happening um, August 26th. Uh, that's when this attack happens. Um, kills 13 U.S. military personnel, 11 Marines, one one Navy corpsman, one American soldier, about 70 odd Afghan 180, civilians. 180, 180 that went up. 180. To. <sighs> yeah. That happens on August 26th. Um, August 29th, there's a drone strike that is allegedly targeting um, some ISIS-K or some Taliban, or and it ends up killing a U.S. aid worker, worker um, a guy named Zamari Ahmadi, kills him, two other adults, and seven kids. Um, August 30th. There's some rocket attacks, uh, but August 30th is when the last U.S. planes leave Afghanistan. The Taliban rolls into the airport, just rolls into the airport and declares victory. And so that there it is. Now the Taliban's in control. At which point, is this when you go back in? Yeah. So <laughs> I was working between Uzbekistan and, and Tajikistan, and I would have gone back or tried to go back a little earlier, but but when I met with these diplomats, um, you know, one of them sort of said to me, and he had said, you know, because he was sort of involved in being, uh, you know, putting me in touch with the middleman to leave Afghanistan, and he sort of said, you know, I've been doing this for 30, 40 years, and been in many war zones sort of working and he said I've never felt more terrified when then I basically handed you over to the Taliban to get in their car to leave and he said I just I was so relieved when you were okay and I out of respect to him I didn't want to go back in straight away so but there was never a doubt in my mind that I was going to go back in of course I didn't tell that (laughs) to my parents or to anybody else but I thought I I planned to come and do a job 
um, I felt confident enough to go back because despite the hype that, that we were sort of seeing in the media and everybody trying to get out, I did know other other sort of British journalists and things that had stayed that were still in Kabul and I felt confident enough that I could go back and, and, and be okay about it. And um, so, we yeah, we made that decision to go back and I thought, you know, I'll let this airport chaos die down and so we'll go back in on the first and we'll drive back from the north back from Uzbekistan border and we'll take that it's about a 12 hour drive across Afghanistan back to Kabul because there really wasn't any other way and yeah that's that's what we did we we came in we crossed that bridge again um and I you know I still and they were honoring the the valid visa so my visa was valid um media visa and so I went back and and you we kind of went to this little passport hut and there was just a Taliban sitting in there and he didn't ask a single question he just had a notebook wrote it down stamped with the Taliban stamp and we were good to go so it was sort of that easy to go back and I thought gosh <laughs> and then you're just driving south then we're just driving so we'd hired a driver um for friends of a friend who'd, who'd come to pick us up and so there was you know all of us jammed into this little Toyota Corolla driving you know from that bridge down just through Salang Pass down into yeah it was about 12 hours are you and you're getting to checkpoints are there yeah so there was about 16 checkpoints and along what does that, that feel way. like you know they, they and still now they barely stop you when they see a woman they see a woman go 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 they're being basically instructed or at least definitely at that point they're instructed don't question a woman don't um you know, if there's a woman in the car, just let them go. Why is that? They're terrified of women. They're, they, <laughs> they, yeah, they just, they, they think, they see it as a sign of respect. Don't question a woman. Don't ask her who she, don't look at her. Don't um, question. Really only once we got stopped, um, I think at a checkpoint, they asked us sort of a few questions, looked at the passports and, and one of them pokes his head through the window. <laughs> it was, again, the, it's like being a clown show. And Jake said to this guy, how do you get your hair so shiny? Because they've got this black hair that's floating around. And the guy looks, he goes, head and shoulders. Mm. <laughs> and the whole thing was like, I was like, I don't know what movie I'm in right now, but this is crazy. Um, but yeah, so they, I barely got stopped at a checkpoint and, and suddenly we're back in Kabul. And really at that point, the only fighting that was really still happening was in Pangaea. And that was sort of the last hold out that the Taliban's hadn't taken yet. So, and you ended up going up there, right? Yes. And the reason you go, well, because there was, there was, there was anti-Taliban forces that fled there. Yes. And they, they were flying the flag of the Northern Alliance right. up there. And it seemed like that could be sort of the, like the, yeah, like the Montana mm. or the mm. or you know what I'm saying, like the Wyoming of, hey, hey, they might have taken the rest of America. This is like a Red Dawn scenario, right? right? These are the Wolverines up there oh, thinking, yeah. all right, we're gonna go up there. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay, because I know Echo does because yeah. he, you know, he's very up to speed on on those kind of movies. But that's what it was. That's yeah. what it seemed like up in Pangaea was. Hey, we've got this is the last holdout. We're like the Wolverines up there. Yeah. We were flying the old flag of the Northern Alliance, and we've got experienced fighters. You're hearing that story. Did you, looking at it, think that they could hold out? So I was hearing a lot of information. People were going to do this, 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 and this. And I've spent a lot of time in Pangea previously, and I knew that there was a lot of great fighters, great guy, you know, people that, that fought during the Soviet occupation, and that was the only place the Taliban's never controlled during their reign in the 90s. They never got Pangea. That was the one place. So they certainly had this, this mentality to hold, but at the same time, all the young men that I knew that had lived there had all fled to France, all of them. And I'm thinking, why have you fled to France? Why have you fled to France? Like you should be here fighting for your province. Like what is going on? So I was a little skeptical, to be honest, because I was hearing, especially from contacts of mine in the U.S., who were like, "We're going to send them weapons and get this." And and I remember just sort of thinking, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm buying this right now. So we decided. Um, yeah, I was like, I need to get in. And, and there was still this debate going on. Has it fallen? Has it not fallen? Because the Taliban's were claiming in that sort of first week of September to have taken it. But then the NRF, as they're known, the National Resistance Front, were saying, no, 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 we're still 
were still in control. And so nobody could figure it out because nobody could get in. The Taliban were not letting anybody go into the province. And there's really terrible cell service there. It's just, it's always been terrible cell service there. So especially if you're in the mountains, you're not going to be able to report back. So there was this really crazy debates going on. And and again, where the misinformation was coming out of was this idea of um, then people started saying, well, pa- the Pakistan has got drones there and, you know, they're supporting the Taliban's. And I looked at the video and then I was like, that's a video game. <laughs> like they're using footage, like news outlets are using footage of a video game. Seriously? And also footage of like hell, U.S. military in Arizona. And it's being passed <laughs> off as the Pakistan is in Pangaea. And I just remember thinking, what? It was this complete disinformation circle. And when I really started to dig into it, I found that it was a lot of the disinformation was coming from India. So basically, Pandya had become this proxy for the conflict between Pakistan and India. And they were sending different information, a lot of which was completely inaccurate. So I said to my fixer, and we need to do whatever it takes to get into Pandya, because I need to know. Has it fallen? Hasn't it fallen? What is going on there? And so he was able to make that arrangement. And we were sort of the first journalists that were able to get in and and go through all eight districts. And that was about, that was on, I want to say it was about September 9, I think I did. We went to Pangaea. Um, And did you drive up there? Yeah, we drove. So it's it's not far from Kabul. Mm -hmm. It's about an hour and a half. And then we we get there and it was very heavily fortified by the Taliban and and we get in and immediately it was very clear to me the Taliban had complete control of it. Um, Even, even, yeah, there was just so much misinformation. Did you talk to any NRF fighters? Yeah, I did. And most, I was watching them surrender from the mountains and and they were coming down and handing their guns over to the Taliban and the Taliban were giving them the letter Mm. and off they were going and they were leaving and, Honestly, and, and I got so much heat for this, but, it, you know, you can only re- report what you see in here. There really wasn't a fight. It wasn't a big fight. A lot of that was exaggerated. There was not a single amount of damage that I saw anywhere in that main street. Not to say there wasn't fighting in the mountains, but I, I didn't. I heard one rocket launched that entire day that I was there. The leadership had fled. They'd already left. Um and I just think that was just sort of, and I still hear it now about, you know, people going around trying to get weapons, trying to, you know, it's not there. It doesn't exist the way it existed 30 years ago. And again, goes back to so many of them that I knew, they're not in the country anymore. But, you know, and, and it was crazy. I got so much heat for simply reporting. There really wasn't was a fight happening? here. And the the diaspora just came after me and people, you know, I just I'd never experienced that kind of backlash just from reporting a story. Um, so I was I was kind of relieved when, you know, some friends of mine from Wall Street Journal and New York Times and things, they went in a couple of weeks later and reported the same thing. Mm. So I was like, well, OK, I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that's uh, the, the uh, when you talk about the, the folks that you knew that went to France. Like, well, give us a little bit of background on that. Well, it was just in that initial evacuation period, just a lot of the young fighters that I knew that they, France was, France was very close with, with the Pangeries and, and um, Amacha Masood, his wife lives there and he spent a lot of time there during his time. And so they have a very close relationship and the French is are very aligned with the Pangeries. So they were mostly able, a lot of the men were able to get, um, I guess, SIVs to go mm. to France in that evacuation period. And, and a lot of them took it and off they went. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't doubt there was certainly a fight there, but I just think it was really blown out of proportion in terms of any ability to to take it. And it was very clear the Taliban had full control of every single of those districts. So you spend, what? how long were you up there, for a day? Yeah, we were up so there for a day. You spend then. a day up there and now... At this point now, the Taliban is forming their government. Yes. And, um, yeah, they, they now run the country. They formed their government. September 11th, they kind of formally announced that they're in control and this is the new, mm-hmm. this is the new regime. Yeah. They reopened the, the ministry, um, you know, for the prevention of vice and propagation of virtue, which is uh, something that existed in the, their first reign where they would go around with these morality police and, and school people and people would get flogged if your beard wasn't long enough or if a woman you know, wasn't wearing the correct burqa. Um, so they were very, very stringent about that. They haven't restarted the morality police 
but at the beginning it was a little bit terrifying. And I, I went to the opening of um, the ministry and, and we sort of just, it was very bizarre. That very first month, you could just walk up and knock on a door anywhere and get in. Um, they tightened down since then, but it was suddenly you just had all this access to things. And because the Taliban's were not used to all this media and people, and it was very bizarre for them. So they were just sort of, Sure, come in. What's your What's your opening line when you walk yeah. up to the Ministry of Prevention of Vice and Propagation of Virtue? What do you say when you knock on their door? We just come. I come with my fixer, my photographer, and of course they don't look at me. Um, they, you know, <laughs> that was the other bizarre thing too. I the psychological effect of being ignored and um, invisible for a month straight is actually just it made me a little bit crazy. So, but I would make a deliberate. A, at first, for the first few weeks, I was being trying to be polite. And I would stand back and just let them go up and you know handle it and and do their you know, pastoring greetings with the Taliban's and make ask the questions. And I would just be in the background. They would interview with me. They didn't like it. They would complain and say, "Why did you bring a woman? You know, I should be interviewing with a man." But they would usually, and my fixer would say, "Well, she'll go. She'll go and write about it. <laughs> she'll go and write about the fact that you aren't going to interview with her." So then they were very worried about perception at that point. Um, but so we, we'd go up and they were doing this, you know, big opening for their, you know, all the guys went in and I couldn't go in. So my photographer and, and fixer went in. I was allowed to go into the compound and I'm, some of the Taliban's bought me a chair and I'm sitting under the tree. <laughs> like, and they're all, you know, doing their, the Haqqanis and everybody's in the building next to me doing their, their sermons. And then, and then finally they said, oh, we need to put her in a room. She can't sit here. So... I get moved to a room and they're bringing me tea and fruit and it was all just very bizarre. And then finally when the celebrations had finished and they're all doing picnics outside, um, the director came to to interview me in the in the little room and he would just sort of sit there and um, very softly spoken and would answer my questions but looking at the ground. So I was, yeah, I was very invisible, um, which at first I took. I said, you know, I'll be, you know, I, I went with the approach that, they're not used they've never seen a woman before especially not a woman working out with men they if lucky they've seen their mother's daughter if they have one and their sister they really have not seen a woman before so i tried to be like well this is very new to them are you wearing a burqa or no 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 i refused i wore everything that i normally wore in afghanistan previously just a hijab and sometimes I wore a mask, depending, but I refused to wear a burqa, I refused to wear an equib, I refused to wear anything other than a hijab because that's all it says in Islam is cover the head and that's it. Mm-hmm. So that's what I went with. So I thought, you know, this is a very big learning experience for them too. And even when I would go to villages, it was so bizarre. You could hear the villages in the background. Is she a man or a woman? Like they just never seen, it was just so new to them. And so at the beginning I was respectful and then I, I snapped. I, I I don't know, I just, I, when you're ignored completely for that long, I just thought, I'm not okay with this anymore. Um, and so I made a very big point of any time we went to meet with the Taliban's that I was with my photographer and fixer, I would walk up and I would just stare at them. I'd say, hi, and I would stare at them. And they'd look the other way, and even in an interview when they would speak and they would just look at my fixer and not to me, I would continue to stare at them. And 95% of the time they broke. 95% of the time, eventually they started to look at me. And throughout the course of my months there, I found that by the end, the, most of them were actually looking at me. And I thought, I don't want to go and perpetuate this idea of it's okay just to ignore a woman, even though to a lot of them that is respect. They think it's respectful to not look at me or ignore me. And I thought, if you are going to run this country, you need to learn what that is going to entail and that is going to be that women are working in the street (laughs) that's how it is foreign women will come in and work um so it was just an interesting social experiment but like yeah staring at them (laughs) so there was like a line because you know early early you said you know that when the taliban would they wouldn't look at you and you were like oh when the cars they would just wave us through checkpoints because it's a sign of respect but then when you're actually trying to communicate with them and they're just not even looking at you were there were they afraid yeah, it's just what they're taught. They're taught to never look at a woman. It's just it's indoctrination that it's disrespectful to, to look at a, at a woman that's not your, your own wife or your mother. That's the way that they're, they're taught. So um, I understand that, but 
they're also going to have to learn. That's mm. that's not always going to be the way. Yeah, and you said, hey, it's not going to. This is the way it's going to have to be in the future. But do you think it'll be that way, or do you think they'll just not allow it? I I I, I saw a big shift over that mm. few months. Of again, I tried to take the approach of. As much as this is new for me, this is new for them too. Like they've never been in a media spotlight the way they are now. They've never had all this social media and attention and and so they're navigating something new as well. And so I think that I think that I, I hope that they've learned I, I did see a change in, in it over that period just in in their interaction. <sighs> um I know you actually I talked about that drone drone strike mm, earlier. Yeah. And I know that at one point you actually... Twice I went and met with the family at the house where it was hit. Yeah. Talk us through that. Yeah, that was devastating. So, yeah, on the edge of Kabul, very small, you know, sort of impoverished area. Um, we went to see that family on that first day that it, basically that the Pentagon had acknowledged that, okay, it was a mistake. And it was heartbreaking. It was absolutely heartbreaking. And one of the, the, you know, it was three brothers that were all sort of living there with all their family and waiting to get that call to go to the airport to evacuate. And one of the the men had lost all his kids. All his three kids were killed. And another one, two of them, just it, it was heartbreaking. The car was all still there. And... I just I can't imagine the the guy had gone to work that day. He was working for an NGO, and they sort of had a ritual where the little kids would run up to the car when it came in, and he would you know then they jump in the car and they drive into the into the house, and so he came back in you know, five o'clock that afternoon, and that's when the drone hit, and the kids had all sort of ran out to get the car and jumped in, and that's when they were hit with the drone. Um, and it was just, it was devastating, you know, the, the mothers who just, who could not speak. And I went back to follow up uh, with them um, a couple of, I guess it would have been in November. So late November, so recently. And I, I you know, I said, has, has anybody, because there were reports that you've been compensated, that the US was going to give them compensation and also speed up their visas to come because some of them did qualify for SIVs and had applied for them before the evacuation so before any of this had happened and they said you know we, we haven't heard a thing we have nobody's apologized nobody's contacted us and in in the U.S. kind of saying oh we're going to give these people com pump compensation it endangered them further because then people around thought, well, these people have money now. And, and you know, and, and crime in Afghanistan is terrible as it is. And so suddenly these people were under an extra layer of threat on top of it. So I don't know what sort of happened, if anything's transpired over the last couple of weeks. I tried to put them in touch with a, a rescue organization that was going to help them get out and speed up. And they said, oh, you know, we're supposedly in contact with some lawyers in D.C., but I don't know that anything ever came out of that either or, you know, if they were able to get out. But... It was really just heartbreaking and in many levels and and what's fascinating is that they weren't bitter people they were not they were not angry at the u.s they were not um you know they didn't want to try to get revenge they want to come to the u.s you know they still wanted to come and live here and, and get out of afghanistan but yeah I, I just hope that 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 case isn't lost is there any news or information about the sort of intel thread that led to that drone strike i mean only from what i've read out of reports was just it, it seemed like a i guess a perfect storm of fire really it just seemed that and again i'm still trying to understand it was like you were targeting a toyota corolla well 70 percent of the cars in kabul are toyota corollas mm -hmm. so I just think it seemed like a perfect storm from many different levels. And I think the U.S. was in panic mode at that point, having had the airport attack a couple of days earlier and was so terrified that this guy who was pulling water out of his car was pulling explosives out of the car. And, yeah, it all just seemed to come together without, I guess, the correct due diligence. I... I've done targets before, hit targets that were just they were just wrong, mm -hmm. and and that was a huge lesson learned for me. I hit a target one time, my first deployment to Iraq, and and pulled the thread on the because I got back thinking that was not right. Like that that person, the guy that we got, is not a bad guy. Mm -hmm. He clearly was not a bad guy, 
and it came back and started pulling the thread. Hey, who who did this? Who gave us this information? And eventually pulled the thread, and it was um, like he had his wife had fired the maid mm. or something like that. It was something like that. The maid was pissed, and so she went and started telling Americans that. Oh yeah, this guy, he's a bad guy, he's financing. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and so that was a huge lesson for me because from then on, my, my question would be who put this X on this building? Because that's what we would literally get would be a, a map and there'd be an X on the building, a red X, just like a movie, a red X on a building. And I would say, who put that red X there? Mm-hmm. I wanna know who put that Reddix in now, and I would pull the thread and find out exactly, hey, this is the information that we've got, this is what's corroborated. It's really, really hard. And if you're not in that mode and there's pressure, that's where these people make these um, quick calls to to try and do something. And you know, again, I, don't, I, I'll, I wanna pull the thread on that more and hopefully I can try and as it, becomes declassified, because I'm sure some of it's classified where they're getting information from, all that stuff can be classified, but it'll be interesting to pull the thread on that and see why they pulled the trigger on on that mission. And the report came back saying nobody was responsible, nobody was held accountable, it was just a mistake that, that they couldn't sort of pin to one person was the Pentagon report on it. And I thought, how is that, how is that possible? You know, how is nobody held accountable to this yeah. at all? Well, you know, even for me, when we hit that target and cap- c- caught this guy, thank God we didn't shoot him. Thank God he didn't resist. He didn't resist because he wasn't a bad guy. Mm-hmm. So we went, we grabbed this guy. But w- the reason I wanted was so engaged with that was because I knew it was me. <laughs> hey, I'm the one that's p- kicking in the door and we're, you know, well, my team is doing that. So I need to take ownership of what we're doing and make sure that this is the right thing to do in the right situation. Because, yeah, I mean, so if there, if you're allowed to sort of push responsibility onto 14 different people that all had a hand in the intel gathering, which a bunch of people do gather that intel, but who's pulling the trigger? Who's saying, yes, go, and you need to own that. If you make that mistake and explain why, and then you can put some procedures in place that won't let it happen again. Mm. And also, you have to question a little bit. You have the Inspector General of the Air Force investigating the Air Force like you know it, would it be better to have an independent person looking at this as opposed to having somebody investigate themselves I don't know I, I don't it's just sort of a question that I've asked myself and there's another thing that can happen as well and this was a, a term that I first heard when I was in Iraq my second deployment good shot bad result meaning when you lay out what happened what a individual saw like if the person that pulled the trigger what he saw what he understood what he was thinking you lay all those things out and you say you know what you that was a good shot i understand why you took that shot i'm sorry that this is what happened but we at least we at least investigate and say okay how did this happen how did this occur and how do we make sure that first of all the person wasn't being negligent the person's not trying to hide anything because look when you're in war you're going to shoot people and occasionally you're going to shoot someone that didn't deserve to get shot that happens and when that happens you have to actually look at it and say okay how did it happen how did you make that decision why did you make that decision what did you see you pull all that stuff apart and with my guys the couple times that something like this happened it was hey i understand why you took that shot and and it was actually the right call and i'm it's horrible that has a bad result but i understand why you did it and it made sense you know that's a lot different than oh wait a second you didn't see anything that looked suspicious or you you know why did you shoot this well i don't know no never got that answer and never was in those situations so for, for to your point for to pull the thread on the whole thing if someone said hey this is what we saw this is the vehicle that we were targeting this is the intel hit that we got this is what our informant said this is what our electronic surveillance said they could actually paint a picture where you say you know in that pressure situation i understand what you did i understand why you took that shot and you took the risk at taking that shot so you could save americans and save an attack i understand that 
okay, now we we at least learned something. But to just say mm, nothing, it doesn't make sense. Mm. It's not it's not the right move, man. Freaking yeah. horrible. Um, you also, <laughs> I mean, you were like on the freaking Taliban tourist trip. <laughs> I mean, you you went to uh, visit <laughs> Mullah Omar's like remote yeah, mosque out there. So what that was, was that fascinating. like? So we took this, you know, again taking advantage of the fact suddenly. We went to almost, I went to almost all the provinces because this was something that I couldn't ever do before by road. Suddenly we could we could travel and this was fascinating to me. So we took this epic kind of journey from Kabul to Kandahar and you know through Logar and then Wardak and then through um, Ghazni and actually it was very bizarre in Ghazni after we stayed at the filthiest hotel that I think I've ever <laughs> stayed at in my life. Like, there was the sheets weren't like it was it was gross and mind you this was still September where it was very hot. Gotta give it was, them a it bad was, Yelp review for God, sure. It was, it was I, I just I didn't have to sleep. The toilet didn't work. Like there was just one shared squat toilet that didn't work and the shower didn't work and it was over flooding. And I just I just could not wait to leave that place. But anyhow, what's so bizarre to I me? I like the fact that you're jumping into random cars with Taliban I elders, but, I, I but just, you don't get mad uh, until you got a freaking yeah, stuffed up shower. But you know it's so bizarre. So we're sitting there and we're in this little like place having dinner downstairs and again it's very unusual for a woman to be out at night and I was like oh you know effort I'm going out so I'm having dinner with you it was my driver my fixer and um, my photographer and then a bunch of Kandahari Taliban's come into the restaurant and sort of sitting there and and staring and doing their you know asking a few questions and went about their business but anyway I found out the next day which was very strange the hotel the, the, and because I have to stay separately to the men. So the guys all shared one room. And then I, as a woman, I have to have my own room. So I was on the other side. Um, and then these Kandahari Taliban, so bizarre. They stayed. They were traveling through, but they stayed that night because they heard there were foreigners there. And literally, like, stayed outside my room that night to make sure nobody came in, which was just bizarre. In a way, it kind of goes back to their Pashtun Wali hospitality, mm. wanting to make sure nothing happened to the foreigners. Um, which, yeah, we can we can talk about that because that's that leads to so many different things. But that sort of shows you this very bizarre dichotomy of of what is happening in this country. Because on one hand, you're sort of seeing acts like that, and then on the other hand, you see the brutality and you see this insurgency that's trying to be a government. So yeah, very bizarre. But Anyway, we continued to go through to Kandahar, which is the birthplace of the Taliban's. Um, on all the roads they bombed up, you know, I'd ask them, who bombed this road? Oh, we did. Well, now you've got to fix it, right? <laughs> like, now it's time because you know, the roads are terrible. So, you know, we eventually got there. And then it's about two hours um, from Kandahar City to go to this little tiny, it's in, in Sangizar, which is where Mullah Omar started the Taliban in 1994. So we drive there and and get to this it's this extremely primitive place. It's just mud huts, it's it's dirt roads, it's and somewhere I really think that the US just never was because it was just it was Taliban territory forever. So we get there and just this one tiny square room um in the middle of middle of nowhere. And go in and, and the Imam and these village elders w- welcome us in. And it was actually strange again, because that was the first time that, and it was at Mullah Omar's mosque that the the mullahs were actually looking at me and talking to me. And I thought, this is just strange because I'd come from all these other places and here sh- should be the most conservative of all. And yet you're actually engaging and asking, asking me about my personal life, <laughs> you know? So I just thought this is bizarre, um, but you know their their sort of philosophy on it was that that Mullah Omar gained traction and and, and gained supporters because this came after the, the there was a civil war going on so after the Russians were were kicked out of Afghanistan you know quickly things became another war again which was the civil war in Afghanistan and and Mullah Omar presented this idea of there was going to be no corruption and the crime was going to stop and he would give food and money and things to the poor and and people gravitated to that and you could see just from sort of the simplicity of this tiny little mosque that you know looked like the carpets weren't replaced in 30 40 years 
that that was really something I think that he did live by was this um, sort of sense of humility. And I think a lot of Afghans at that point when they were starting to see corruption among all these warlords, they gravitated to that. And that's how he was able to to build a very strong following very quickly. Um, you mentioned to me about seeing people addicted to drugs there. Mm. What What's that culture like? Because it's the mecca for opium yeah right? yeah absolutely i think it's something more than 90 percent of the world's heroin and opium come from afghanistan so and the taliban's really pro that that has been one of the number one ways they were able to make money through the insurgency was through the the selling of of those drugs and they a lot in helmand we went up to helmand to uh sangin and, and places like that where they grow the poppies and it's funny because i went the, the taliban were putting on this big you know display of we're getting rid of the drugs it's haram we're going to kill the the crops and blah 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 and um and i was at the counter narcotics and 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 the guys you know they they're putting on this display but then it became very evident to me especially when I went there, and the Taliban themselves are harvesting it. And I said, well, so you tell me it's haram, and then one of them says to me, it's only haram if we sell it to Afghans. If we sell it over the border, it's not haram. So basically they said, we can sell it to other, we can kill other people in other places, but we don't want to kill, um, we don't want to kill Afghans. So that was sort of their philosophy. I don't see them ending that anytime soon. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to, I think, probably find avenues to legalize it in the sense of um, countries that perhaps are friendly to them that need opium for, for medicine. I think that's the approach that they seem like they're going to want to take is, is to try to legalize it in some way. Now they were using the jails to, they were call, rounding up a lot of the addicts from the streets and, and there's a lot of addicts in the streets and rounding them up and, and putting them in jail because they didn't have proper rehab. So that was sort of the approach that the Taliban have been taking. <sighs> and kids Doesn't, too. There were a lot of sadly, there's a lot of young kids. Is the cult? Is there like a drug culture of some kind, or is it just something that sort of seeps into? Hey, this is what we grow. You start trying it. You start yeah, eating I think it or whatever. I think, you know, with the, there was like one little boy that I talked to who was 13, and he was addicted, and he was in this jail. And I said, "Well, how did you start taking this?" And he said, "Several years ago, he'd have to go and buy it for his dad. So he'd go and buy." get the get the you know puppies and heroin for his dad and then eventually he just you know tried it once and and and, the, and he became addicted so i think it, it tends to to filter mm -hmm. through families and it's really impoverished families usually um so yeah just now <clears throat> you eventually do get like uh detained and kind of accused of being a spy <laughs> right what happened oh with my that? gosh so that was also in kandahar so what happens is as a journalist, so just to, to go back a little bit, so when you get to the country, as a journalist, you have to go to the, the Ministry of Information and Culture, which is sort of like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they check your credentials and give you a mujahid, Zabiola Mujahid is the spokesperson, basically gives you a signed letter that says you are accredited journalist to be able to work and, and you flash that letter. So when I am going through a checkpoint or when I'm going to try to do an interview, I flash my Zabiola letter and they say, okay, she's pressed, she can come in or whatever the situation is. So, and when you go to a province, you have to, the protocol is you're supposed to go and inform the Minister of Information and Culture that you were there so that they know that you can get through checkpoints and you're not gonna get arrested. So. In Kandahar, that's exactly what we did. We went to the Ministry of Information and Culture and did an interview with him about blah, blah, blah. And he said, okay, you can go anywhere you want. Goodbye, sort of thing. So we're like, okay, well, we're going to spin Boldak, which is the border of Pakistan in Kandahar that um, sort of leads into, uh, into that tribal area. So into Quetta. So we go down to spend Boldak and there's just people everywhere trying because the border is mostly closed and there's people everywhere and instantly I just get mobbed like absolutely I'm talking just just flooded by hundreds of, of people that just surround me and I'm you know with my fixer I'm like don't don't leave me because these people are going to mob me so I'm trying to do an interview and just you just get mobbed it was it was crazy and and <laughs> the no, is this because you're Western? Yeah, is this yeah I guess they saw, they saw a camera and then they saw a female uh, and they thought, okay, journalists, everybody sort of, they're curious, they want to tell their story. <laughs> but what was bizarre, Jocko, is the Taliban were flogging them, like whipping these guys to get them away from me. And I was like, please stop that. Like, <laughs> I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> they just continued to 
to follow. I was like, you're just getting whipped. And I was upset about it because I didn't want people getting hurt. <laughs> just why why are you not leaving when this is happening it was bizarre and so what ended up happening was it just it got to the point where it was so much there were just just people everywhere and just what, what was the closing uh, in on me this town was like what who what, what kind of town was this was it like, like a super it's remote a border town? town border town so it was just a border crossing so it was a small bit, bit just so many people but they were just freaking hype to see you just 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 <laughs> it was the craziest thing and i i mean you have that a little bit but this was a whole other level where i just thought oh my goodness like what is happening um and anyway, i couldn't go anywhere and i would try to grab people to interview them into a store and i'd look out the window and suddenly the store was just surrounded it was so crazy and I said, I just, I didn't, I, and, the, and so the Taliban's were coming along asking questions, what is happening? And we tried to call the driver and we had this funny driver called Shafiq and he, um, he always likes to eat. And every time he goes, he tries to find eat. And suddenly Shafiq's not in the place that he, we left him. <laughs> Shafiq had gone off to get food. <laughs> At the Kalaba. Yeah, and the car the wasn't there. And, 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 and Naweed, my fixer, is calling Shafiq. And being like, where are you? Where are you? He's not answering his phone. And so the Taliban's come along in their police vehicle. And we're just trying to call Shafiq. And I'm telling them, like, we're leaving. We're leaving. Um, we're just getting our driver. We couldn't contact the driver. And so next thing you know, the Taliban's like, all right, get in. And I said, oh, I don't want to get in your car. I don't want to go to the police station. And they said, nope, get in. And so we get into the police vehicle. We go to the police station. And they put us in their detention room. And we're sitting there for a while. And I'm thinking, this is going to get resolved really quickly. Hours and hours. And then finally, just more of them are piling in. And the top intel guy is piling in. And all these Taliban's are piling in. And I'm showing them my credentials. I'm showing them the letter. I'm showing them the passport. I'm showing them my press card. And they said, oh, this is fake. No, it's not. They said yes, it is, and they, you know, con- accusing us of basically spying. And I just, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. I'm, I'm a journalist. I've showed you my credentials. I've showed you my passport. You have all my information. So I, I don't know what to tell you. So we're sort of sitting there. More people are coming in, hammering us. I can see my fixer is starting to get worried, and he's a very sort of cool, calm. Doesn't really things don't rattle him too much. But I can see he's starting to to get worried and, and doesn't know what to do. Um, and they're telling you know us about these Pakistani spies that they arrested a couple of nights earlier. And and long story short, eventually, many hours later, they were able to get in contact with the the Zabiola's office, who was able to verify our information. And and then they were extremely apologetic and they said, well, we'll take you to the border and and you can you know photograph mm. the Pakistanis. And at that point, they were fighting with the Pakistanis. So. Um, yeah, I guess that was so, so. We ended up going to the border and and getting you know some good interviews and, and footage, and they were very very apologetic about the situation. But yeah, it was just one of those those situations where that that usually is the case for journalists is that especially working in the Middle East or in Asia like Afghanistan, they will accuse you of being spies, and you have little recourse to mm-hmm. argue and say, well, I'm, I've showed you my credentials. I'm not, but I don't know what I need to do to convince you anymore. You've got like a survivor's bias, but you just you just make it through everything. It's crazy. <laughs> like there's so many people that this your story always seems to end up working out. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, touch, touch on touch wood on that one. Um, what about the Hakani? You you visited coast kind of. So host, yeah. So that was um, that's sort of where the Hakani is. A lot of them come from that in Paktia. And uh, yeah, so that was interesting. So I have a good friend of mine who's from host. And so we went down there. And you know, it's a, it was an interesting place because it, you know, again, it's the, sort of the home of the Hakanis, but it was very untouched a lot of the time by actual conflict. It was one of the few places where you had roads that were decent and that um, it was a very self-sufficient kind of place. But but yeah, what struck me going in is this big billboard of Bo Bergdahl that's just there as you <laughs> enter <laughs> as you enter the city. And it's Bo Bergdahl and another mullah. Like a salute to Bo Bergdahl. Well, no, it's not. It's him looking down and like he's sort of got blood on his face and he's looking like he's detained and miserable. And then there's this mullah standing in the picture next to him. And it's a poem in Pashto that doesn't really make a lot of sense. But it's basically a tribute to this mullah. And I'm still oh, very okay, unclear. Okay. I thought you were saying it was a tribu- tribute to Bo no, Bergdahl. No, it's, like, oh, it's almost sort of like a... a 
it's a tribute to the Moolah, but for some reason they felt the need to put the Bo Bergdahl there. It's this new, new billboard. And then I found out that the the host, the governor of host, is actually one of the Gitmo Five. So I guess he put it up there to you know celebrate himself in some way. And and he actually invited us to to go and do an interview, which I didn't end up going because he didn't want. I went and met with the mayor, but I didn't go and meet with him because my he didn't want my friend, the friend that had the hosty friend who had taken me to host, he didn't want her to go. So I I felt sort of obliged to. I mean, be just loyal, just explain yeah. that Taliban five point in case yeah. anyone doesn't know what yeah. that means. Yeah, so I guess when when Bo Bergdahl was traded, um, he was what cap- captured in. 2009, he ran off base, I think. Something he like that. He deserted his base <clears throat> in, uh, in in the neighboring Pakzia, mm-hmm. which is next to Host. And he was captured by the Taliban, and the, ultimately the Haqqanis took him. And he was, I guess, yeah, under captivity for a long time. And then eventually under the Obama administration, I think it was in 2015, they orchestrated a deal to release five uh, Gitmo detainees uh, in exchange for, for the one US, uh, U.S. soldier. So... And now, now that one Very of those guys is uh, what the mayor? What is he? He's the, the Mullah, governor. The governor. He's the governor of Host now. Yeah, wow. they're all in top leadership positions. They're all running the show. In the, <sighs> and the Khanis themselves. I mean, Siraj is wanted by the U.S. for five million dollars. He's now the Minister of Interior, and his uncle Khalil is the Minister of Refugees. <laughs> Which, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that entails. <laughs> It's crazy. So how about the, let's talk a little bit about this. So, you know, you mentioned the Haqqani, you got Taliban, Haqqani and, and Taliban are very aligned, mm-hmm. right? Um, in fact, they, they kind of say there's no difference between the two, even though there's... Well, the, ta- the Haqqanis are actually a designated terrorist organization, but the Taliban isn't. But I'm saying in yes. Afghanistan... They're very close. Well, now it's basically entwined. Right. I think before it was... There were slight sort of ideological differences, and in in many ways, the Haqqanis were they were the leading they were like for the attacks. Yeah, they were the hardcore. Most of the suicide bombings were orchestrated by them. They were the ones kidnapping, who still have Americans in ca- mm-hmm. ca- captivity. But um, and I mean, yeah. you know, and very close with Al Qaeda. Uh, uh, you know, the founder of the Haqqanis, Haqqani himself. Yeah, this was a guy that was you know funded by the CIA yes. to fight the Soviet Union. Reagan called him personally a freedom fighter. Yes, <laughs> yes, the, it's bizarre. So, so when we talk about things being bizarre right now, they've been bizarre for a long time. They've been very bizarre for a long, we, we paid him millions of dollars, um, the the founder of the Haqqani, and I think, he's, I mean, it's, an, it's a fascinating guy, you know, I mean, he was, um, yeah. he's got two wives, got seven sons, I think, three or four of his sons were killed in combat. Yeah, and he, he's the really the one who brought a lot of the Arabs into the fold. So until that point, it was very, you know, Afghan, Pakistan, he started getting a lot of the Arab funding, which brought in the Bin Ladens and a lot of that kind of funding. But um, but what, what I found to be really interesting in, in really researching the Akhanis is they're very educated and they get a lot of education. A lot of their, their wives go to the Middle East, go to Saudi Arabia and get... Educations, which is ironic given that so many of the women under the Taliban are deprived of education. So it's sort of this dichotomy, but but everyone I know who's worked closely or knows the Khanis well will always say they're 20 steps ahead of everyone else. Like they are the brainchild really of the Taliban. So they know what is going on down to a T. And Siraj does not get photo. There is not a photograph of Siraj that you can possibly find. A grainy photograph the FBI has, but it's very old and very unclear. He does not get photographed at all. And he did an event once when I was there, which was um, celebrating suicide bombers at the Intercontinental Hotel, which, of course, the Haqqanis, you know, sent suicide bombers to several years earlier. The whole thing is crazy. Wait, so when did you go to this thing? Was this on this? I didn't go trip? in, but oh, this okay. was in this was in late October. They had they were giving land and compensation money to families of suicide bombers, which we can get into because they are very much continuing their suicide bombing despite being a government. But they, um, so he's doing this big event there, but in every photograph that was taken, it's him from the back or him from the side or his face is blurred. And I said to to one of my sources there who was who works for him, who's a Kabul Intel Taliban guy, and I said, well, you know, what is up with that? And he says, Siraj will walk around the street every few days. 
and nobody knows who he is. So he will walk around the street to check, you know, what's happening at the checkpoints, check what the Taliban's are doing, um, and nobody knows who he is. And he's going to keep it that way. Undercover boss. Yeah. There you go. So, hey, but but there, yeah, there. It the whole thing is just crazy. And then you have so he's minister of interior, and then you have Mullah Omar's son, Mullah Yakub, who's only about twenty nine thirty. He is the minister of defense, and those two. are Bat heads. They don't like each other. They're coming from different schools of thought. So it's just, it's a crazy world. <laughs> and then outside of those two groups, you have ISIS K. Yes. Yes. So they, you know, they've had a presence in Afghanistan since about 2015, but essentially were pretty much defeated around 20. I think the Afghan government in early 2019 basically said that they were defeated. And that was the whole idea of the U.S.'s mission up until, I, I guess, Trump authorized them to go after the Taliban. But up until then, it was Al Qaeda and then ISIS. And they've really made a, a terrifying resurgence. There's almost daily attacks happening across Afghanistan as I was there. And, and they are like even more hardcore than the Haqqani. Is that an accurate yeah, statement? Yeah, they've got a different ideology. So what makes the Taliban and, and the Haqqanis different to ISIS and to Al-Qaeda is they're very, the Taliban are very much focused on Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They don't have any grandiose desires. They, they say, we want to make sure that no foreigners come into our country. We want good relations with everybody, but we don't want another foreigner to come into our country. And they're so like they're, isolationists. Yes. They're very focused on Afghanistan, whereas groups like ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda have a much more global ideology where they, they want to see, as the fighter said, they want to see their interpretation spread throughout the world, and, and they're the ones that will plant attacks in, in other countries, so therefore are viewed as a, as a national security threat, whereas the Taliban isn't. And that's really hard for the Afghans to, it's always been hard for the Afghans to really wrap their head around because the Taliban's were doing so many suicide bombings and attacks, and, and to them, they're absolutely terrorists, and they couldn't, it was hard for me to explain to them why the U.S. Was sort of leaving the Taliban alone and going after these much smaller groups that were at that point not even doing that many attacks, and that is is going back to well, the Taliban is not a threat to the United States necessarily in a, in and of itself. Did you, you went to the area where the Taliban blew up the ancient Buddha statues? Yeah, to Bamiyan, Bamiyan, beautiful province, beautiful like, province. 1500 years old those statues were yeah. you know and that was that was crazy so what and I, I talked to the Taliban's about this about you know was that a mistake and, and so they say no 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 that that wasn't a mistake that was the decision then but now we're going to protect everything and so I went to a few other places with ruins and the Taliban's are all protecting it and I said are we are you going to continue to protect these Buddhas or you know in Mazinak and other places yeah 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 that's our orders for now but what we have to remember is this might be their orders for now, mm -hmm. but they didn't blow up those Buddhas until early 2001. So at that point, the Taliban had already been in control, what, since 1996. So it was left alone. And then Mullah Omar did it as an extortion because he wanted the international community to give the Taliban money and the international community wouldn't. So then he threatened, well, I'm going to blow up the Buddhas and still didn't get the money. So... He made good on his promise. So that's the thing with the Taliban. Right now they might be okay where everything's okay, but you don't know what they're going to do next month. You don't know how the orders will change. And so, and you get there and it was bizarre because the Taliban were taking selfies in front of these blown up Buddhas. And I said, well, you do know that they, it was you guys who blew these up, right? It just, you know, incredibly strange. But Bamiyan is a beautiful province. It just, it shows you, I think when we think of Afghanistan, we just think of, the war and the bloodshed, but it just is is one of the most re remarkably aesthetically beautiful places in the world. And, mm. and in Bamiyan is just a prime example of that. It was the first national park in Afghanistan. Now there was a the drone strike that killed the facilitator and planner, and yes. you did a little a little investigation on that as well. Yeah, right? so I went there a few times. So that was just outside Jalalabad in Nanganha. So Nanganha has always been the hub for, for ISIS K. It's on the Pakistan border on the east, and it's just that is where, you know, Tora Bora is, where bin Laden went and hid uh, immediately. 
Uh, I also went out to the the Moab side, if you remember, when the US dropped that massive mother of all bombs mm-hmm. in beginning of 2017. That's also in Nanganha. So um, so th- there's an area, a couple of different areas, but but that particular area was a district called Sirkarod, and that was just outside of Jalalabad. And it's one of those very eerie places, and you go there and you feel like the skin on your, your neck is standing up because it, it just doesn't feel right. And so the house that was hit was in the far corner. It was actually a really nice house compared to, you know, a lot of the mud huts and things. And this was a nice sort of brick home. And we went into the home um, and you could yeah, see where it was hit. And it was, it was so precise. It was just like, you know, this one section of the backyard and this chair that had been blown up and nothing else was touched. So I went and talked to, to the neighbors there. And, and one of the, the guys who, who was there and as the drone strike hit, which was close to midnight, and he was on – I guess guard duty on a roof across and yeah he sort of said that that there was a strange guy that sort of hadn't been living there that long but um but would come and go and yeah they hit that night and then sort of immediately I guess a car came and took the women out of the house and the children and then um, the next day, a bunch of Taliban's came in and were, were taking things out, taking flags, taking, he said, he didn't know what they were taking, but big boxes that were just weighing the car down. And then Taliban's went in there after that and took out more things, or I guess, from the house. And then he said that the, those Taliban's were found without their heads hanging on a, a tree the next a couple of days later with an ISIS stamped letter next to it, basically saying anybody who removes these bodies is going to, to kind of be next. And he said eventually that um, if someone from another district came to collect them, but they were just hanging there on that tree for, for many days because people were afraid of ISIS. And he said that every night sort of you ISIS comes in, you, they, they come in and, and take control. But during the day, it's very much the Taliban doing patrol. The Taliban get scared and disappear. And then... The, yeah, the ISIS fighters come in at night and he even showed me his own warning letter he got from the Taliban's for doing a local news interview after that drone strike and then he said that the Taliban saw the interview and, and were then accusing him of being the one that gave the location to the foreigners. So it's complex. And then the actual ISIS-controlled centre where a lot of these people come from is the next district over, which is Chapagar. So, so we went into that one day, which... I don't know it was the smartest decision, but I'm here today. <laughs> you, you should play lottery. I should. Because you would win a lot. Uh. <clears throat> um, so I know you left, what, the first first, yes. first of December? Yes. So like a, a few days ago, yes. a week ago? Yes. Um, as you as you look back, is there any, anything else, any other high points from there? I mean, you there's know, a bunch I of mean, stuff. Yeah. I'm sure you, you, you know, um, on your website, you've got a link to a bunch of the articles that you've yes, written over yeah. there. Yeah, and so. I have a Substack that I also so oh, okay. I subscribe to that, and I usually put all all the articles into that, and also a little bit of extra kind so of background. So, how do they get to the Substack? So it's just uh, you can get it straight from my website, or it's okay. just yeah, it's and your your website is what Holly McKay H O L L I E M C K A Y dot com. There you go, yep. and then you can get to the Substack. Yeah, go into some more detail there. But as you look at what's going on. Um, What's what's going on now? This is a disaster. I mean, I, I know one thing that you'd mentioned to me is like, and it's sort of the the I guess the the, the like the ground or the most granular sort of point zero for the disaster is like what happened to the military working dogs that got left behind. Yeah. And I, you know, that was such a big story if everybody remembers. There was about 130 dogs and you see these pictures of them at the airport. And so I wanted to to follow up on that and find out what what happened to those dogs because the DOD was very quick to come out and say they weren't US military dogs, but they were contractor dogs. So the, the long story short is that you know, different uh, contracting companies had given those dogs to a Kabul Small Animal Rescue, which is run by a woman named Charlotte. And she was tasked with getting them out. But when she got to the airport, was basically told, you know, you can't get all these dogs on the plane and you can only take out what you can carry. So there was a lot of controversy. Oh, my gosh, these dogs are being abandoned. But, you know, she's someone who really does amazing work in in rescuing these animals and, and caring for them. So I wanted to follow up and find out what happened to them. And 
I talked to her and she said they recovered about 70. Um, most of them, or not much, half probably had been killed by the Taliban. And then you had, so a lot of the Spaniels, which are very friendly dogs, had run up to the Taliban and, and the Taliban just are not, they don't have dogs as pets. When they had the rule in the 90s, dogs were outlawed. They're considered unclean by the Taliban. You can have cats, but not dogs. So a lot of them were shot and then they sort of saw that these dogs had gotten so much attention and thought, well, this is a bit of a bargaining chip. So they kept a lot of the German shepherds because they thought that a lot of the German shepherds must be guard dogs, even though a lot of them were not trained as guard dogs. But you see, especially at the airport and other places, the Taliban's walking around these dogs that they have no idea what they're doing with. Like These dogs, like, they don't look like, you know. So so some of them survived. Some of them were left to run around the airport compound and, and some of them got out. So, yeah, it, it was a sad situation. And, and we can debate for days, you know, obviously humans have to yeah. get priority over dogs. But I think well, we all can agree we, we love our animals. Yeah, well, what about that? What about the, like the hum- from a humanitarian perspective? of what's going on there now it's an absolute disaster and that is that is the heartbreaking thing is the to give you some context when i got there it was 70 afghans to one us dollar it was a hun- it hit 100 by the time i left so that just shows you how quickly that devalued their their afghani devalued the currency people can't afford bread people can't afford just basic things. There, There is no middle class in Afghanistan anymore. It's people are selling their belongings on the street. Um, you know, crime has gone through the roof again. It dropped initially because I think people were in fear that they were going to get their hand chopped off. And when it became prevalent that, that wasn't going to happen, at least not right now, the crime went back up. And it's – you go to these public hospitals and, I mean, they were just – the amount of malnourished babies that are just dying on mass, and and the mothers are on the floor breastfeeding, and it was something I'd really just never seen to that degree, and it broke my heart because of the amount of money that that we as Americans, and the amount of treasure, and the amount of people, and the amount of you know effort that had been put into this, and and this was the result, and it's only going to get worse during the winter and 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 the US and, and other countries are going to have to make this very uncomfortable decision of do we unfreeze this money this 9.5 billion that was frozen when the Taliban took over and the world bank and and international monetary fund also froze do we unfreeze that and enable this government to to support a country of 38 million because there is no money coming in. There's absolutely no money. You cannot get money out of the banks. Um, yeah, it was it was very challenging to work in because of that environment. But we're going to have to make this decision of do we work with this government so that these innocent Afghan people who have already gone through so much can survive and have some kind of dignity in their lives? Or are we going to just, I guess, turn away and say, no, 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 these people are, are human rights violators. We're not going to to talk to them and, and to isolate them. And and I always look back on history and I hope that we don't make the same mistake because there was no more isolated government than the Taliban during their first reign in the 90s through to 2001. They were blackballed by everybody. They had no money. The one person who came in and gave them money, and not very much, 1.5 million I think it was, was Osama bin Laden. He's the one who came in and gave them money. And so naturally, they were going to protect him. Naturally, when the U.S. said, hand him over, Mullah Omar said no. He's the only one who came in and gave us money. So it's a very complex decision, and there's going to be a lot of people that feel very strongly in many ways but it's an uncomfortable decision that needs to be made on a diplomatic level of how we're going to deal with this. Because I think the Afghan people have been through enough and and they don't deserve any – they don't deserve to suffer the ramifications of this any more than they already have. And that, that's, that's sort of the uncomfortable choice. There isn't many options. Do you – as when you got back to America – um, I guess it's been a couple of days ago, but even even as you were, you know, overseas and you were online and you were looking at the way that the stories were being presented and the way that the events were being presented, with now, the you know the way the media and social media and emotional media all works now, what was your, you know, what was the delta between what you were seeing and what the world was being fed? There was quite a dichotomy. So if I was just to look at Twitter and to look at what was happening, I would think there was mass slaughter on the street. I would think that the, the Taliban were going out and pulling people from their homes. And, and, and certainly there are isolated cases of that happening. 
but that was very much the exception, not the norm. And that was not accurately reflected. I think, you know, as strange as it is, the Taliban's were trying to show this image of, of they want to be recognized. The, the- is it safe to say that the Taliban is trying to rebrand? Yes, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of this. <clears throat> I hear a lot of, well, they haven't changed since the 2000 and, you know, or their first reigns in the 90s. And I, I don't think that's accurate. They have changed. They've changed a lot in many different respects. But, um, but yeah, a lot of the information I was seeing about these just, you know, mass slaughters and, you know, I think there was one thing where, and a lot of people had asked me about it. There was a rumor going around about a girl that had been beheaded by the Taliban. And when I looked into it and I asked my fixer to look into it, it turned out that she had been killed in July, so before the Taliban's came in, but it was an internal family conflict. It had nothing to do with, you know, and yet this was being presented as this just happened last week and, and the, she's being beheaded. And I saw like Kim Kardashian or someone was then retweeting it and putting it on a story and then a million more people are asking me. And I thought this is how this cycle perpetuates. But if I was to to sum up the situation, it was certainly terrible things were happening, but it, it wasn't what was being painted. You know, as I said, I, I could work freely and, and, and mm. unharmed. Um, and, you know, I was only wearing a hijab. So a lot of the information just was, was wrong. And, and there was something I even saw, you know, there was a picture that was going around where it was a, a woman in a burqa and she had a chain around her ankle and was being led by a husband. And people were saying, you know, this is Afghanistan now under the Taliban. I looked at, you know, a quick reverse image search and you see, oh, no, that was 2003 Iraq and somebody photoshopped a chain to this woman's ankle. So there was so much of that. And um, and I think there really were few journalists that were in there. I didn't I didn't meet too many other Americans. Like I met a couple of Americans that came in and, and then left again. But generally there was just a few European journalists that came in. And so a lot of the work was being done from, from outside the country. And I think it just shows you the importance of being on the ground. And a lot of news organizations don't want to invest in that anymore. But Afghanistan really showed me the importance of of having that ground perspective because it's it's so different to what you see just sort of an aggregating or even talking to people. And I think, you know, a lot of in- interviewees were talking to the diaspora, people that had fled, but their perspective was no longer in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of disinformation. Um, yeah, and it'll be, it, it, no one knows, right? Yeah. <clears throat> we don't know what the Taliban's going to do. Um, <clears throat> you know, they were pretty brutal in their last you know time in power from 1995 1996 um, up until 2001 up until up until the Northern Alliance and America went in there and I mean they had some 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 bad things happen right um, starvation and and just bad some bad stuff happened mm-hmm. I mean horrible it's, a, it's a, you know definitely human rights violations and all Huge. that stuff absolutely has happened and and you know there was obviously there were some reports of terrible things happening again and it's hard to know but to your point unless you have people on the ground you it's very it makes it even more difficult to actually know what's happening and make decisions on what you're going to do when you're basing it on photoshopped images Mm. yeah absolutely um you mentioned osama bin laden what was talk to us a little bit about Osama bin Laden oh, Osama bin Laden's presence in the psyche of the Afghan people now what did you observe from that perspective yeah so i really think you know his legacy is still very strong in Afghanistan and even places that i went to you know in again the jalalabad the the information and culture minister there is told me straight don't do any stories on Osama bin Laden <laughs> so I was like oh you wait you wait now <laughs> I'm going <laughs> um, so but you see that legacy sort of carry through and, and they're all in power because of him and again it goes back to he's the one who sort of came in and, and gave them money when no one else would and so in return for that they gave him gave him safe harbor and it's under that code of Pashtun Wally which is really the highest moral code that the that the Pashtuns have in protecting guests. And, and it's the same code that they use to protect somebody like me who's a, who's a guest in their country. So it's it's a very complex sort of thing. But, but when you talk to regular Afghans or, or students or, or people that, you know, and they're young, 
20 something they they don't know who he is and it's it's just interesting because you sort of look at this war and you that was continuing to go on and 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 yet you sort of have the the people that are uh, caught in the crossfire who just sort of have no idea of what what happened and and what the background is and and why this is all uh, kind of still going on so it's interesting and al-qaeda still you know certainly exists in afghanistan too um my understanding from the Taliban's is that they've been told that they are not allowed to do any take any military actions that they have to you know they're allowed to be in the country but they have to to stop you know not plan anything or do anything otherwise they'll be in trouble but I think a lot of the times too a lot of those al-Qaeda members have just been basically folded in into the Taliban's and a, a part of the intelligence units or a part of that whole operation yeah it was definitely some of your articles mentioned the fact that you know, some 20 year old Afghan didn't really know who Osama bin Laden was. Yeah. So sometimes when I get into discussions with people about the divisiveness in America, I'll reference the fact that I work with a bunch of different companies at my consulting company, and most people that you talk to, they're not thinking about what's happening on Twitter right now. They're not thinking about this. They're, they're thinking about what they're doing. They're thinking about their job. They're thinking about their company. They're thinking about moving, you know, how they're gonna grow, how they're gonna go to new markets. That's what they're thinking about. That's what they're doing. That's what their life is. Is is it similar? I mean, I guess this is a rhetorical question, but did you find the same thing? In Afghanistan, most people are like, okay, well, the Taliban's in charge or the Northern Alliance in charge. I wanna, you know, continue to get my job done and raise my family and move kind of forward like kind of leave me alone type thing. Mm-hmm. You have two camps. You have the people whose entire day is is fixated on trying to get out. Um, trying to get out of Afghanistan. You're trying to get out. So there's really two camps. And, you know, each, even now, just every day, all day, you know, my, my messages, my LinkedIn, everything is just flooded. How do I get out? How do I get out? So you have that camp. And then you have another camp of people who are just basically – um, I, I know that I can't go anywhere and this is the new reality. So how do I survive and how do I feed my family? And, and that's really what it comes down to. It comes down to survival, especially now with the the crisis being what it is there and the challenges of, of just day-to-day life. What are, what are people, when somebody messages you, you get 10 messages about, I want to get out, I want to get out, I want to get out. Why do they want to get out? What are they? What's what and are it's they, a mixed thing. Fleeing? You have you have people that are certainly have legitimate reasons to get out. Um, a lot of the commandos that I met with that are you know, terrified because the commanders are really leading the charge in a lot of the fights, and and they're very concerned about retaliation. Um, but then you have a lot of people who who and, and again, what I found a lot of people who were maybe drivers or worked for different companies who are desperate and terrified to get out. But when I talk to them, I say, well, where's the threat? nobody's been threatened or they're passing around a WhatsApp letter that everybody's been given that's fake or so uh, in a way that the fear is contagious and again that's where I'm saying the fear doesn't always match the reality and what I found was that people thought well so-and-so's scared and my neighbor's scared and everybody's scared so I'm gonna have to be scared too and I'm gonna have to leave so that yeah it was it was contagious and and that's what I found that a lot of the the worries were, were self-inflicted as opposed to an actual real threat that was there. Mm-hmm. There's got to be like a massive level, though, of like suppression, right? right? I mean, if you're a person that was sort of open-minded and sure. moving in this yeah. direction yeah. and now like it's over. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. And, and, and you don't get that. And especially for women, too. You know, that's deeply challenging. Girls are still not able to go to, to public schools. I think private schools are still open. But secondary schools are, have been closed for girls now for months. And the Taliban's keep saying, oh, it's because we've got to make sure that they have transport that's separate to the men. And I said, well, great. We'll get you some buses. Oh, and then there's another excuse. So I'm not sure what's happening with that. But, you know, women that were definitely used to going to work and to other places, and they're, they're at home. And, you know, that's heartbreaking. Women. You know, I met with many women who, you know, were doing, um, you know, in the the national sort of taekwondo teams or in the mm. national tennis teams. Yeah, there was a big article about their soccer team too. Yeah, you know, and and now team. that then they're not allowed to to um, to do their, you know, uh, to not even practice, let alone go into any tournaments. Even I met with a top MMA guy there as well. Is you know great fighter he's i think two fights away from ufc and he's like we can't fight anymore and he said that he tried to do a fight the taliban's told him that 
they have to wear like full clothing, which he said, you know, we obviously can't do that. And the Taliban came to their first fight and broke it up and turned into a big mess. But, you know, he's concerned because, you know, he can't get out, but and he's trying. But, you know, he's someone who used to go to each match with, you know, the police, you know, your police, you know, Afghan police flag and you know, was very pro the former security forces. And so, you know, it's tough for the guys too, even even though they can do, you know, a little bit more than the women. But music is completely kind of outlawed and, and, and arts and all of those sorts of things. That, yeah, you're not allowed yeah. to paint any people. You're not no. allowed to paint any living things or film any living things or photograph any living things. Yeah. There's well, they lot. haven't been too strict about that. But yeah. Instruments have been outlawed. Yeah. Except well, for like some drum. Yeah, well, they, they have this, nish- their music is this nasheed mm-hmm. music. It used to drive me crazy. So they would get into the car and they'd put in, you know, insist in, um, if we're driving somewhere remote and s- damn Taliban's would get in the car and they'd put in their nasheeds and it was just this, it's Islamic music without instruments. It's all vocals. And then there's bomb blasts and bullets and <laughs> just like, and they turn it up and I was like, it's like their motivation. It's their mm. battlefield music. And it's like, this is crazy. And that's what they play all night. And the Taliban's actually moved next door to the house that I was living in. So I would deliberately go and get my two pack and <laughs> big <laughs> I just blast it. I'd be we'll a complete fight their music brat. with our music. Yeah, and I was like, you know what? It's time to go, Holly. They better not come for my guitar. <laughs> so here's here's what I find. This is what's this is what's so hard to really contemplate as a as a human being, right? What percentage of people are 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 don't want it to be this way, right? What percentage of people don't want it to be this way, and would give anything to go back to whatever to yeah. 2019 yeah. and be moving in a certain direction and have the females ready to go to school and be able to play your guitar and be able to do MMA what percentage of the population feels that way versus what percentage of the population wants to go back to the old Taliban ways and strict sh- Sharia law I'm not asking you you can, you can make an estimation yeah. but it's very difficult and then, okay, if you're that, if you're ninety percent is on board for Sharia law, and that's what we're doing, and hey, the ten percent that aren't on board with it, you, you best get out of here because this is what we're doing. Or is it ninety percent of the population wants to just go back to again two thousand nineteen, move in that direction, move towards a, a more open society? And if that's the case, and it's a, just a strict small percentage of people that maintain power and control via force and brutality well then 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 what are we supposed to do so i think there's really again when we see with the media what we're seeing is always generally coverage that's coming out of kabul or coming out of a city and i tried to really make an effort to 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 go to as many rural areas and provinces because the perspective there is completely different so i'd say if you're going to estimate in somewhere like kabul you know 80 percent of people want that previous life because mm-hmm. they were able to, you know, there was bars, there was music that, you know, could go to clubs, you could go to, you know, get alcohol, you could do all of these things because you had that foreign footprint there. Um, but you go to the villages and, you know, that are already very conservative where the women don't necessarily, you know, go to school past the age of 13 and, and that are very much relegated to the home and they don't leave. And that's just customary because that's that's the way that their life is their lives are actually going to get better. And I say that because they don't have to face the daily bombings anymore. They don't have to deal with the ramifications of war, but their actual lives aren't gonna change because they were never really privy to all those sort of new Western inspired, if you will, freedoms. So you can make the argument that you know, for them, they now have a more peaceful life. But in the cities, that's where you really see women and, and people losing a lot of those freedoms and and suffering but but what i think is also interesting that came out of this was the number of talibans that were embedded into the military into the government into every possible avenue in every city and suddenly when the talibans were able to take power these people came out people i knew for years and years and years who were working with journalists as fixers said to me oh yeah i've been taliban for 20 years And now they're out, you know, and so, and friends of mine, you know, I had a, you know, even with my fixer, a good friend of his, he was saying that someone he's known since he was very young, 
when the Taliban's took power, suddenly he finds out he's Taliban. Like, it's just these people kept secrets for so long. And I think that's also why the Taliban's were able to come to power so quickly. They infiltrated every possible, you know, government entity that they could. Um, what do they do? What's the Taliban doing with their with the with the military equipment that they took over. So um, I, you know, it was interesting. So I did a, a tour of the airport just before I left, and and you still see a lot of the damaged aircraft. The U.S. blew up a lot of the aircraft before it left, but you see a lot. They still have all those Russian Russian helicopters mm-hmm. that are still there, and and they have a lot of engineers. They brought back a lot of the technicians from the previous government trained by the U.S. that are now there able to to help you know repair whatever they can. Um, and they still do have very limited air power, but I know that's something they're trying to build because the Air Force is something that, that they want that they didn't have before. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was funny because I was, I was sitting outside you know, one, one afternoon and, and you see there was, there was a big blast, a big bomb, and, and the smoke's in the air, and it was, just, it was down at the military hospital very close. And next thing you know, you're hearing choppers in the air. And I said, I, I haven't heard this for ages. You know, what's going on? And they were flying a Black Hawk and two of the, the Russian uh, MH17s. And they w- had apparently dropped a suicide bomber onto the hospital because ISIS was attacking it. Again, they're still using suicide bombers for situations like that. But Dang. yeah, craziness. So it was a, it was an <laughs> ongoing it was an ongoing, you know, thing. But but so they certainly have the capacity if they need it. But they're saying, oh, we're just going to use it for important and urgent circumstances. So God. yeah, the whole thing is 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 backwards. But yeah, I actually went to a suicide bombing school that I found, which was in a kindergarten on the edge of Kabul, where they train the suicide bombers. Um, you know, and you have these men just begging begging to be chosen just pick me pick me it's like the highest honor that they could possibly take and and you know that if despite being in government now there's no plans to to get rid of the suicide bombing schools um how about what are you seeing for lessons as you look at it now you're looking back on it you've been gone for a week now what are you looking Mm -hmm. at what what kind of big picture strategic lessons are you seeing? My biggest thing that to, to, to drive home is, you know, we can talk all day about military strategies and, and the Taliban military strategies, but at the end of the day, and I feel like I'm a broken record saying this, but corruption, 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 corruption. The last government backed by the U.S., there was so much corruption on every possible level to the point where – if you wanted to go and get an interview at the U.S. Embassy, just an interview. If you were a university graduate who wanted to, to get a job at the embassy because that was that was a cool thing to do, you had to pay a middle person about $5,000 just to get an interview, let alone if you were to get a job. Then you'd pay them a whole bunch more. And that was in every government institution. Money, you know, and, and this is what I would get angry about because I would tell a lot of these Afghans, I said, that's my money. As a U.S. taxpayer – you stole our money, or not you personally, but your previous government, you stole our money. And you took that and you lined your pockets. Kabul could be Dubai by now, $2 trillion, and this is what has come from it. And that is because the corruption on every level was just so rampant and so disgusting. And even even when you know a lot of these warlords and people were fleeing the country when the Talibs were taking over, there was just there was chunks of gold that they were keeping, you know, hidden underground, just wads of cash that just in unfathomable numbers. And there was not a thing that you could do to get through daily life without paying a bribe. You know, to get through a checkpoint, you're paying a bribe to get whatever you needed. Like life for Afghans was difficult because of this institutionalized corruption that I think the U.S. looked at and said, well, this is too systemic for us to do anything about. We just have to leave it. But really, to me, that was the root of the problem. So people looked at that. Afghans looked at that and were like, why am I starving here when this local governor is is you know, rolling around and with all this money and uh, a Rolls Royce and all these fancy things? And I can't, you know, I have to pay every de- every time just to get to my job. And that's what the the Taliban really capitalized on that. They capitalized on, well, we are not going to be corrupt. You know, that's against Islam. We are going to, um, you know, support everybody, treat everybody the same. And so people that didn't even ideologically want to be, you know, with the Taliban, they were driven to that. And I, I've seen that in many countries. You want to fight against the government that you feel is is stealing from you. And 
it, it just got to the point where it was it was so bad. You had you had judges in provinces or, or lawyers like just falsely accusing people of something, and and taking them to court so they could get bribe money. So it, it just and it was just it was on every possible level. Even even at the hospitals, you had medical staff stealing the surpri- supplies so they could go and sell them at a local pharmacy, or because they owned their own pharmacy, and that was going to pay them better money than the government salary. So you know, it's it, if you're going to go into a country or give country any sort of form of foreign aid. I, I hope that the U.S. or and the con- other countries can learn that lesson of if you don't stop that right in the beginning, if you don't hold people accountable, and there was, there was never accountability to any of the corruption or stolen money. This is the result you're going to get, mm-hmm. and I saw that in Iraq too, with you know people joining ISIS because they wanted to fight back against the government who they felt was stealing from them, were corrupt, and was suppressing them. And it wasn't about we want to be part of ISIS because we agree with ISIS. It was, no, we, we want to fight this government because they're not here for us. And that's the, when you pull the string on Vietnam, the South Vietnamese government was just completely corrupt and a lot of the issues that they had were due to the exact same type of corruption. The whole, the whole um, system operated on through corruption and scratching each other's backs and you know getting money here and putting it in your own pockets and you know that was just the way it worked and that was a huge part of the issues that they had and why and it's the exact same thing it's literally the exact same thing um, seen it again I know that um, you know you've been you've been gone so you were over there for August September October November December that's like a, a deployment yeah. A deployment into a into a war zone where everything's falling apart. What is that? That's I mean, are you coming back this time? What, how's it? How's it? How's the transition back to reality? Back to norm, norm, normal American life? Yeah, it was incredibly difficult. I think for me to leave this time, um, I felt tremendously guilty about leaving because I knew that that I can. As an Australian and an American, I can get, you know, I, I'm able to get a flight out to Abu Dhabi and, and able to leave freely when it's something obviously a lot of Afghans want. And I felt tremendously guilty because, again, you know, I, I never think my life is any more valuable than theirs. Um, I just happen to be lucky enough to be born in, in different geographical coordinates that have given me a different a different passports and... and um, and a very different life and you know the afghans are some of the most truly beautiful people they're just so hospitable very kind um i, ha- I have a great love for the afghans i always say that i've been to many places in the world but i have never quite sort of fallen in love with a place the way I've, I've fallen in love with afghanistan over the years and it's just it's very special people and i felt tremendously guilty um, just I guess you know walking away from them and I knew that it was time to leave and I knew that um, you know some of the decisions that I felt that I was making um, as a journalist were I, I was taking risks that I knew were, were, were I shouldn't be taking um, and I think when you get to that point when you sort of maybe don't care so much about the outcome it's time to take a break and that's sort of a point that I think that I'd gotten to you know especially with going into some of the ISIS areas and and even my photographer was hesitating and I was okay well, I'm fine I and I didn't have the same I think normal reactions you should have to those situations just you know the natural sense of fear or, or worry and and so anyway so I, I knew it was definitely time to take a break with that but I think yeah, I felt very guilty, especially those first few days. I, I was just you know wanting to turn around and immediately go back. But um, my first thing, so I couldn't go for a run, and I'm a big runner, and I couldn't go for a run for you know five months. And so the first thing I did when I got to New York was go for a run. And I'm running, and I look, and I see a, a sign for a, a beauty salon on the sidewalk, and I said oh, they've reopened the beauty salons. <laughs> that was my first instinct. And I thought, hang on a minute, you, you know, you're in New York City now, so you're not in Kabul. So, um, yeah, it's, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a strange transition. And as I said, when I'm driving down, I'm looking at the roads thinking how great they are. You know, how great is this road? Why did nobody bomb this road? Mm. And then just remembering, um, remembering where I am. So it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a transition, but... And so how long are you going to stay home for? 
I don't I don't have a home right mm-hmm. now, Doco. <laughs> I don't. How long are you going to sleep in places where there's beds? <laughs> I do need to get a home. Actually, that is the objective for for early 20 early 2022. Ugh, scary. Um I am going to get a home and so I have a good base, so I I think I need in to In America? Yes. So I can probably probably Virginia, I think, maybe. I kind of like that area. And then what's on the horizon for you know what are you going to do for work wise? Are you going to are you going to you know you wrote Only Cry for the Living, which is an incredible book that really gives such clear picture of everything that went went on um, with the ISIS battlefield in the Levant. What what are your plans on this stuff? So I have so Jake and my photographer and I have a, a photo book we're working on, and he's got some really just beautiful pictures of Afghanistan throughout this transition. And then I I'm going to knuckle down and get the writing for that done. Um, just sort of it's a, a way to present I guess Afghanistan to people in a very visual way. Um, you know, just sort of showing people what what it's like to to be there through the fall and then in that period after and and who the Afghans are, who the Taliban's are, who are all these different players. So that's uh, the writing project I'm working on and then just, yeah, continuing to do journalism and little bits and pieces of of different things here and there. So How much writing is it going to take to get that book done? Not a huge amount. It's not going to be super word intensive because of the pictures. So probably... And I have so much material already. It's really just a matter of sitting down and, mm. and sorting through what I think is going to be the most compelling to go with the pictures that we've already selected. So Kind of like a Humans of New York, but kind of. more like Humans of Afghanistan. Yeah, a little bit. And then sort of go into some of the some of the decisions and some of the major things that were done and, and, and said and explain things in, in, a, in a way that I hope people can resonate with, really. Yeah, that's that'll be uh, that'll be awesome. I mean, I didn't think of that connection until just now, like the Humans of New York, which is yeah, a fascinating yeah. book, and and obviously your your uh, Jake take just just unleashing picture after picture over there. I'm sure he's got incredible photographs, yeah. and then yeah. the context that you can put around those, and the history that you can put around them, and the the, the knowledge that you have. That's um, that'll be awesome. Yeah. So. Just, uh, yeah, continuing with the writing and then I will return to Afghanistan probably in the spring is my is my plan. If the Taliban will have me back if they're not too mad. <laughs> a lot of the stuff I've written, some of them have been pretty mad. <laughs> Do they contact you? Do you- um, sometimes they contact my fixer and, and uh. threaten and I had I had an issue with one Taliban for a long time that just drove me nuts. I, had, I was a little bit worried about him actually. What did you say about? He was just very angry about everything and angry and ang- just just an angry person. Um, but eventually I just, I just said, I don't care. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Come and get me. I don't care. Well, they can't get you here, but maybe no, over no, no, there. in the Kabul. I, I said, I thought, should I leave? And they thought, no. I said, come and get me. Tell him to come and get me. Come to the house if he's worried. Come to the house. <laughs> okay. Because he was like, where do you live? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come to the house. But anyway, he he backed off and went away. But most of them, um, I think, you know, I think they have a media team that tries to read through three, three. three read through reports but they're desperate for recognition mm-hmm. so they want they want attention but they're increasingly becoming very um cracking down on a lot which in the beginning they were very open and very free and it was quite easy to get the interviews but toward the end it became very difficult to to get any approval well i don't know you kind of remind me of alex honnold you know who that is no. alex honnold is the rock climber that climbed el cap without any ropes and he's they do like tests on him and there's no he has let he registers less fear than a normal human and i think you're kind of like that i think you register <laughs> less fear than a normal human so el cap is three thousand feet in yosemite straight up wow. granite and he climbed it with no ropes there's a uh incredible wow. movie about it um called free solo but i when he did that I remember just thinking, man, I hope that guy never climbs without ropes again. And of course he does it all the time because right. that's the way he is. So when you got back, I was kind of like, okay, cool. I hope you never go over there again. <laughs> but I guess that's like asking Alex Honnold not to do what he loves. Yeah, I guess. It, yeah, and I'm very grateful for the fact that I I just I feel very compelled. And I, I really do love what I do. And I don't, I, at this point in my life, I can't imagine not doing it. I don't know what. I don't know what I would do. Is it just like curiosity? It's curiosity. It's it's just it's being this rough draft of history that I just think is just a fascinating 
experience to have. And, and it's something I really thought about a lot. You know, you're sitting with all these Talibans and, and they're bragging about killing Americans and they're bragging about shooting down, um, you know, American helicopters. And, and they're, you know, and I, I really had to reflect on it a little bit because I thought I'm in this situation, you know, what is my job here? And, and, and I think what journalists can do is it's, it's not to, you hear all this stuff about being a voice and giving people platforms. No, that's not how I see my job. I see my job as being able to communicate the other to the people. And I say that because we have to understand the way that they think. And we want to, it's very easy to paint things as black and white, as, as, as this is the good guy, this is the bad guy. But you have to understand why they do what they do, where this comes from, what their impetus is. And, and that's the way that I sort of see a lot of journalism is not to go in and interrogate or to stick it to them or to – you just have to go in and have a conversation. And sometimes that's – I find it to be really difficult because, you know, here's somebody that's, that's you know, bragging about killing Americans or, or – and yet you still have to go in there and have tea and talk to them and, and it's – it's a balance of, of sort of this compartmentalization with writing from a place of humanity, but I, I see that as that communication as being something that, that really journalists can do the best because, you know, we aren't government employees, so we don't have to – we can speak to anyone mm-hmm. we want, and, and I think it's an important job to be able to – to understand, you know, where they're coming from and what that objective is. And, you know, one of them said something interesting and I'd love to get what your response would be because I, I didn't have a – I just didn't have a response. But he, he looked at me and he said, you know, if how would you feel if I went to Australia and I started recruiting Australians to kill other Australians? Wouldn't you want to fight me back? And I thought about it for a really long time and I, I didn't – I didn't have, I didn't have a great response because, as I said earlier, Afghans were not the ones who who drove those planes into into New York. That was they were Saudi. Osama was found in Pakistan, so we can sort of debate about what role Afghans really even had in those attacks. And so, in putting myself in his shoes, you know, I didn't have a great response for. Well, how do you respond to that? Yeah, well, that's the important thing about what you said earlier, and this is something that we don't do a great job of, and by we I mean America and West, the West in general, is trying to understand what other people are thinking, mm-hmm. right? And if you don't understand what other people are thinking, as a, I mean, this is what Sun Tzu said 2,500 years ago in the Art of War, you have to understand what your opponent, what your enemy is thinking. If you don't understand what they're thinking, your chances of winning go down dramatically. So anytime you try and impose your thoughts on the enemy or you assume that you understand what they're thinking, you're making a, you're making a huge mistake. You're making a huge strategic mistake when you let that happen. So when you talk about what you do as a journalist of saying, okay, let me set my emotions aside and let me listen and let me ask earnest questions about what they're thinking and, and why they're feeling that way, and then you actually listen to what they have to say, that is something that People, ha- people should do every single day, first of all, as a leader in any organization, as a parent in, in a family, as a child in a family, in a, in a spouse in a relationship, in a governmental situation, that's what we should do. That's what you need to learn how to do is try and understand what other people's perspectives are. And you can only understand what other people's perspectives are if you ask earnest questions and you actually listen to what they have to say. And you'll probably figure out that what you thought they thought is not accurate. Mm-hmm. So there's a, you know, there's a whole a whole road to go down with that, but that's something that we don't do very well. And you know, I think journalism nowadays is a whole, it's just a while, it's not what it used to be, certainly. I think you're about as close to an old school journalist. I mean, you're, I mean, I know there's others that are like you, but you are in the model of the old school journalist that's out there to gather information and kind of report what's going on. And like you said, you know, you're reporting about what the, the, um, the new Northern Alliance was, how well they fought. And you're like, oh, they, there wasn't much of a fight. And people are mad at you, mm, super, mad. super mad at you because you told what you saw. And now maybe if you would have said there was no fight and I didn't see, any, you know, there was no fight at all. And I don't remember your quotes from that article, but 
You know, it's like, hey, I didn't see any fighting. I saw, you know, the Taliban moving very dominantly through the area. So you're literally saying what you saw. You're, you're leaving room for, you, you even said today, you said, hey, there might have been more fighting in the mountains that I didn't see, but you're saying from what I saw in these heavily populated areas, there wasn't any resistance. So, or there was very limited resistance. I saw one rocket. That's not a lot of resistance. So um, I, I think that that people listening, asking earnest questions is something that the world has forgot how to do. Part of it is, I would say, the driving factor, and that is our own egos, to think, well, I know. <laughs> it's like the worst thing to say. The worst thing to say and even in a worse thing to think is I know. I know what you're thinking. I know what they're thinking. I know what the enemy is doing. You don't. You don't know. And the minute you think you know is when you start making mistakes. It's when you start assuming that you understand things and you don't. So I think what you're doing is extremely important. Um, I'll still go with the Alex Honnold. I, I actually don't want you to go to, back to Afghanistan, <laughs> uh, but I know you're going to. Um, be safe. And and we'll keep tracking on you. Anything, Echo? You got any questions? Yeah. What exactly is a fixer? So sorry, a fixer is something that journalists or NGOs even, but primarily journalists, when we go into foreign countries, we hire um, sort of a local person. Sometimes they're a former journalist. Sometimes they're just a connected person, and they you know help. Often will be a translator, um, and they will help uh, sort of help us facilitate interviews and and make calls and and just kind of. Yeah, work with us. It's, it's almost sort of like, a, you know, I ended up calling my, my fix in a weed a producer. So <laughs> essentially he's kind of like producing for us, you know, he's yeah. doing a lot of the background. And, and it was really funny when we went back this time because for the last 20 years, all the Afghans and, and the fixers have been speaking Dari, which is um, sort of an Afghan dialect of Persian. But now it's all Pashto. Everything's written in Pashto because that's that's what the the um, Taliban's use. So a lot of the people that were, you know, fixing for 20 years are suddenly like, well, I can't speak the language <laughs> that's needed. So it was a big, big trend. A lot of the fixes have all left the country. So it was this very much a, we had to find new people to work with. So it was a... All the big learning curve. So it's kind of like uh, the Las Vegas VIP host yeah. kind of situation. Yeah, but yeah. that's what I was, I was yeah. about right? to throw it at you. you can hook you up with this stuff. You know, yeah. for the interview. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Echo has like the, you know, he's got that different background yeah. where he was in the <laughs> nightclub industry for a while. So for him, it's like, oh, that's the VIP host. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep, yeah. Yep, I can yep. get you in that back room. Hold on, let me talk to Fred over here. We'll get you taken care of. Yep. Yeah. So understand. my poor fixer is, you know, having to talk to the, the Dash and all these people on my behest. But yeah. Um, Holly, we can find you at hollymckay.com. You're on Instagram, Holly S, and it's H O L L I E S McKay. McKay is just M C K A Y. You're on Twitter, you're on Facebook. It was crazy to watch you on Instagram when you were over there um, and see you. <laughs> putting like Instagram live yeah. <laughs> up and you're reading like, oh, you're reading people's stories. Like I look at Echo's story, oh, it's like he's in his kitchen. He's <laughs> making a freaking sandwich. Oh, I'm I'm posting that I just got done working out. And you're like, I'm in a hotel in Mount Maurice, Missouri, or Sharif, and the, the we're surrounded by outside. Taliban. I'm yeah. like, wait a second, this is uh, interesting. So yeah. people And should, hollymckay.substack.com, I think is the URL for yeah. Substack. Yeah, so okay, so the Substack, there, that's yeah. where you're putting your information up. Yeah. Awesome. Holly, anything else? Thank you for having me and for, yeah, letting me talk a, talk some more about Afghanistan. I think it's very easy for these things to fall off the news once, once you know, the evacuation happened and it fell off the sort of the radar very quickly. But I think it's something that's very important to Americans and important to, you know, to my generation who really grew up, you know, with after 9-11 and, and so many people that I knew that went to fight there. And I think it's important that, that we keep Afghanistan, you know, somewhere in our minds. Mm. Well, you're certainly helping us to do that. And thank you for coming back to talk to us. And thank you for making it back to talk to us. And <laughs> thanks for letting us know for all you do to go out there and let us know what's actually happening and reporting it so that the world knows what's really happening. It's uh, definitely an eerie window into the heart of darkness. And it's a big risk for you to go in there physically, mentally, uh, spiritually, but you're doing meaningful work and it does have a big impact on the world. So thanks for doing it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. And with that, 
Holly McKay has left the building. Awesome that she could stop by and kind of share some of that stuff with us. Lots of lots of lots of craziness in the world. And sometimes it seems like all that craziness that's going on in the world, what are you going to do about it? How can you help it? Look. I don't know what you're going to do for some young girl that's getting no education in Afghanistan right now. I'm not sure what you can do about that. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I do know this. You got a little control over your world, what's going on in your world. Mm-hmm. Try and make your world a little bit better. That's my recommendation. Man, that's crazy how she mentioned the corruption, you know, yeah. like how much of a fact. Like, I, I mean, of course, no one's going to be like, yeah, I'm totally down for corruption. No one's going to think that for the most part. So, But you don't really understand how important that is Mm -hmm. to be like legit and squared away in that way. And I really had no idea what she was going to say when I asked her that question, because even, you know, reading through articles and stuff, you know, I thought maybe she'd have some strategic uh, thing about the way we treated the trial, you know, just whatever kind of the more, more uh, common complaints that you'll hear about how Afghanistan was handled. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, that was a definitely very interesting and insightful aspect to bring up how devastating corruption can be because not, then then it's kind of like nothing works the way it's supposed to work. Exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Nothing works the way it's supposed to work when people are corrupt. Think about everything the way things are supposed to be. Yeah. They're not that way. Yeah, she she said something super quick too. She said it super quick, but I was like, ooh, that kind of put add, – add the corruption into this this point where she said some of the ISIS fighters joined ISIS not because they mm. support the ideology. It's just because their government is so corrupt, and it's like, bro, like the government has so much power over an individual anyway. So if it's like they're corrupt and they're just tired of that corruptness and they're like, you know what? I'm going to join this group who, sure, their stuff is kind of crazy, but – at least I can fight back and have some power against this yeah. this government that I'm powerless against that's corrupt, you know? We, we, it's two things going on. We take it for granted in America that things aren't corrupt, and we take it for granted in America that things aren't corrupt. <laughs> Do you get my double meaning on this? What mm-hmm. I'm saying is we walk around like, oh, you know, well, this is American, things aren't corrupt here. Right. But we take that for granted. Mm-hmm. And there's things that go on inside the government that are absolutely corrupt absolutely freaking corrupt yeah. and the more that stuff grows and also the more exposure it gets because of social media yeah. and because the way people can share information and the way you can google information mm-hmm. it's just a different world and i think that the amount of information that's available is going to start to become a light on a lot of the corruption that's in the u.s government yeah. in the in now and it's going to get even more so in the future yeah, it's yeah. The when you get exposed for being like a whatever, some corrupt person, like in a in a position of power, there it seems like there's an element of shame that goes along with it when you get caught. Mm-hmm. Then, then again, I'm no expert in Afghanistan, so I don't know. But it seems like it's just so accept more accepted mm-hmm. in certain places, you know. Yeah, well, like look at what just happened with the Cuomo guy from CNN. Yeah, why did they get that? Well, because he had texts going back and forth. That that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago, maybe. Mm. twenty. Were we texting 20 years ago? Yeah, Not too I much. 20, the first time I ever texted was we were in Vegas with Task Unit Bruiser, and Leif and Seth were texting. Yeah. And they started texting me. And I'm like, what are you doing? Just call me or whatever, because you're dumb, yeah, yeah. right? You don't know what's happening. <laughs> I'm like, just freaking call me. Sure. They're like, well, we'll send you a text when we get to wherever. And I'm like, well, just call me. Why are you going to text me? And then sure enough, I'm sitting in some bar somewhere, and it's super loud, and mm-hmm. zzz, zzz, get the text. <laughs> and then just responding. Yeah. You know. It's like, yeah, they remember the T, what do you call it, T9 word, you know, the one. Mm. That, it's not now like a phone. It's like yeah. actual key, keyboard. Well, I got I to gotta say I had a BlackBerry. <laughs> Hell yeah! You when did. I was the admiral's aide, I got yeah. issued a BlackBerry. Yeah, that was that. And was so then I had the BlackBerry, mm. and once you have a BlackBerry, it was hard to do anything else because they were freaking a super squared away little rig. Yeah. Even my, fr- I got the first iPhone, mm. the very first iPhone that came out. Stoner went and got in line, oh, and got us both iPhones, 
And three days later, you had like a three day return policy. I took it back, got, a, got, my, got my BlackBerry back. Huh. The BlackBerry was a squared away little rig. Huh. And then Check. now it gets crushed. Yeah. Now it gets crushed by a. Well, it gets crushed by the iPhone for kinda, sure. Kind of everything. Because they thought they knew, they thought they had a lock. Yeah. They were arrogant. Yeah, you gotta be. BlackBerry was arrogant. Humble. Isn't it funny how like even when you say, I texted like texting is so new that we the language didn't even catch up. We just assumed that okay, text is now a verb. So now we gotta accommodate you know. So because before then, text is a noun. Mm-hmm. Now it's a noun and a verb. Mm-hmm. So now you need past tense, present tense, future, you know, mm-hmm. all these Check additional things. Right, over here. Here. Hey, I'm just saying, English major, you got yeah, to relate yeah, to this kind of stuff. Sure. So you're like, oh, yeah, he texted me. It's like, is texted a word? Well, I guess it is now. What's the past tense for text? Mm-hmm. Text? Just text? He texted me? Texted in the texted, past. Texted, right? Has yeah, to be just said. T-X-T and then an E-D. Yeah, texted. Yeah. Texted. But see how that's like a question? Texting. Kind of texting. Yeah, we're not saying? sure. It sounds weird. Texted no. doesn't sound quite right. Yeah. It's a weird word to say. Yeah. So well. we got to be careful of that. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> Very careful. But so uh, there's corruption out there. Yeah. Um, lots of craziness in the world. Like I said, try and make your world yeah. as squared away as you can. How do we do that? Well, we got to stay capable, I'll tell you that. Stay capable, stay healthy. <clears throat> How about that? You should just go with the first thing in the top of your head that you've utilized. Say like, hey, I was tired the other day and I went and tried the new freaking pre-workout and it was savage yeah. and I ended up jacking big steel. Yeah, <clears throat> well, okay, I will, but it's <laughs> not that story because when I try when I took some pre-workout i tried it a long time mm. ago when i took some pre-workout hey i wasn't tired i just did it for the, for the mind our body pre- our pre-workout yes, okay yeah. for the mind body connection okay. experience while working out okay didn't let me down full on and it's kind of and it's different you can feel the difference like when you don't take it because i don't take it all the time mm-hmm. yeah so that was my experience recently that was day before yesterday is there a moment where you say oh feeling this certain mode right now Gonna jump into. I'm gonna gonna get that little extra hitter right now. Yes. And what is it? What is the feeling? Um, what do you mean? The feeling that compels that behavior? Yes. Yes. Um, it's pretty random. It's not when I'm tired though. Tired because uh, uh. it doesn't have enough caffeine for me to be like, oh, I'm tired. I need to take this two, for the two tiredness. Scoops, two scoops. That's. Yeah. Whatever, almost 200 milligrams of caffeine. Come on, bro. What are you, a crackhead? I'm not ready for the two <laughs> scoops yet. You know? Dude, JP, at five o'clock in the morning, yeah. he dry scooped mm-hmm. the new pre workout, yeah. f- chased it mm-hmm. with Sour Apple Sniper, mm-hmm. dry scooped another one, <laughs> and chased it again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a little bit beyond <clears throat> beyond my, uh, what you, my consumption uh, capabilities. Either way, yes, pre-workout, I did that. I would say the, uh, the more significant experience is with the energy drinks. Mm-hmm. That's the one. That's the one that gets you. Yeah, and very very often, like I drink them a lot. <laughs> How often do you drink them? I would say pretty much every day. Oh, okay. Just one a What's day. What's your favorite you know? flavor? Mango, by far. 100%? By far, yeah. Do you have anything else on standby? Yeah, kind of the rest of them. Okay. The citrus, I don't really drink as much. Okay. But either way, this is what you do midday. Okay, so I wake up. I don't really eat breakfast anymore. Me neither. Yeah, so before lunch, I have one of those. Mm-hmm. That's good. So mm-hmm. That's the good one. By so, one of those, you mean uh, one of these energy drinks. Discipline go. Yes, energy drink. Healthy I energy Henry drink. Henry Gracie reached out to you on the on me utilizing the term energy drink. Yeah. Did he send a cease and desist? No, no, no. He liked it. Okay. Yep. Props to Henner. Yes, he says that, energy. by the way. So, yeah, energy drinks that are healthy, no sugar, sweetened with monk fruit, good mm-hmm. for you. Healthier. You're better off after you drink them. Legitimately good for you. Yep. You pay no back-end health price with these energy drinks. Yep. So, yes, one a day is good. Here's another front-end uh, investment you can make mm-hmm. into your life, into your world, is get joint warfare, get super krill, so that way... You can proactively fight the yeah. mayhem that you're causing to your own joints. It's true. You know how like um, you take things for granted? Mm. Joints yeah. are that. And th- as far as back to my experience, I have been taking my joints for granted. Luckily, I haven't like 
had any kind of terrible learning experience to remind me of that. Mm-hmm. I just every once in a while, like it's hit, I get hit with it. Like for how old I am, I feel like I don't really have any joint problems. Yeah, Actually, and you gotta you know what you gotta do too. You gotta continue to do. You gotta continue to do the work. Yeah, man, you gotta you don't surrender any positions. Yeah, don't surrender any positions like your workout positions. Like for me, overhead squat. Yeah, overhead squat. Like I hurt my arm real bad. Remember when Dean Lisch? Yeah. And I could not lock out my arm. I could not do an overhead squat. I couldn't do it. Zero. And then finally it started healing. And it took months and months and months. By the time it was healed, my body had kind of forgot how to do an overhead squat. Yeah. And so the first time I tried to do an overhead squat again, my body forgot how to do it. And it felt terrible. And I couldn't use any weight, like barely any weight. I was using the bar. And part of that little ego in the back of my mind the little complacency in the back of my mind was like you know what overhead squats not that big of a deal you should you know you don't really need to do overhead squat Uh, yeah. yeah. you know and then I said to myself no if you surrender that movement if you don't do that movement you're it's gonna go away forever yeah so I'm very cognizant of that that's why another thing like going deep on squats the minute you're like well you know I don't need to go that deep I'm gonna go heavy so I'm gonna go less deep no actually don't do that yeah Correct. You want to do that occasionally? Okay, I get it. We're we're we're, we're doing muscle confusion, <laughs> right? <laughs> right yeah, but don't you got to keep those keep those movements alive, man. Keep but, it alive. And now that you met, that's what reminded me of that deep squats. Mm-hmm. So like, okay, so deep squats. If you let's say because some people don't have what the ankle, what yeah. do you call mobility, mobility. or yeah. for that, but. If you have ankle mobility and then you don't do them for a while and then try to do them, you'll feel like, oh, wait, I got to get my ankle like mobility kind of back, you know? Yep. And here's the thing. When you say you lose it forever, it's an, it's not like you stop doing it and then it's gone, gone. You, you, it's, you stop doing it. Then when you start doing it, it's like you get it back, but not all of it. You yeah. paid like a little tax yeah. as got, time goes and, on. And it, the longer you wait, the m- longer it might take to get back. The bigger the tax, too. Same with uh, muscle ups when I could hurt my arm. Couldn't do muscle ups. Couldn't do them, you yeah. know? By the time I started doing muscle ups again, I could do one. Yeah, like it was, and it was not fun. Yeah, and so then I was like, okay, well, today I'm going to do three in my whole workout. I'm going to do three muscle ups. You know what I mean? You do that, them on the rings. Yeah, ring yeah. muscle ups. So it's one of those things. That's what, you know what this is. This is a little, a little tool to you, you put in your brain to think when you have the moment where you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to do this particular exercise today. Just yeah. remember. You're surrendering that movement. And I'm telling you, please yeah. don't do it. So there you go. Don't surrender. Don't surrender any movements. Yep. Don't take it for granted either. Yeah. Take the joint worse fair. Take the yeah. krill oil. That'll help physically keep your joints in the game. Mulk. That's, that's on top of you keeping it in the Mulk. routine. Mulk. You're going to need, let's face it, you're going to need to rebuild. If you're doing overhead squats, you're going to need to rebuild. Yes, sir. So you're going to need some mulk, some extra additional protein that just so happens to taste like Dessert. Banana cream pie. If we're if we're into it, that's the new one. <laughs> the banana banana cream bomber. Yeah. Who thought of that name? You? Maybe. Maybe Pete. It's good too. The design is good. I was mm. I was on Origin USA, the website, mm-hmm. and they got whoever designed that that website. Pete. I'm just assuming Pete. Yeah, but, yeah. but well, Pete definitely designed the the uh, banana bomber thing. Yeah. He, you know he's super into the you know that's good. He's good man. He likes he's his little designs. Oh yeah. You know, respect, me, I'm like respect. just making a black bottle, write banana <laughs> on it. Yeah. He sends me options. No, no, no. He sends me options. Yeah. What no, do you think of this? Good. What do you think of this? I'm like, bro. Right, banana. So there you go. Yeah, you like you bring it back down, like mm-hmm. when you know. Cause let's oh face yeah, it. let's face it, dude. If Pete was running, like had full, full say, yeah, yeah. the freaking banana, the milk would come in like a giant banana shaped bottle. Oh yeah, yeah. Like he'd get too creative. Yeah. But then yeah, then he'd you're like the dichotomy wild. and whatever. Bring yeah. it back down to where it needs Just to be. Perfect. To balance things down a little bit. It's perfect. It's all perfect in my opinion. So origin USA. Origin USA. Yeah. Uh, American made stuff. Oh wait, but what about what, uh, for the drinks? You can get the drinks at Wawa, by the way. Mm-hmm. You can also get everything at the Vitamin Shop. So check those out. Yep, and then true. you were saying Origin USA. You yes, were saying Origin USA. You were talking about jiu-jitsu. You were talking about jeans, jeans, boots. all that stuff. Everything at Origin is made in America, straight up. Even the materials are made in America. It's an American uh, economic thing. <laughs> <laughs> They, 
the uh, uh, what do you call it? Kind of sucks the, this no. recording right now, doesn't it? <laughs> no, I, the thing, no, no editing that. No, no, no. We're you painted yourself uh, we into don't, a corner. No, we don't have to it could, because it is a full on American thing. thing. Huh? Yes, yeah, it is. Correct. It's not yeah. American thing. Yep. I'll oh, stand it's now. American yep. thing. So, okay, so uh, bringing back certain elements of the st- of the industry to the point where it's almost it's kind of bringing back. And industry. Yeah, bring back all elements of the industry. Yeah. That's what we're doing. Freaking all in one, straight up. Um, yeah, you can get geese, which you should definitely get some geese. Which by the way, the geese are not this isn't your this isn't your father's gee. This isn't your mother's gee. This is a new deal. Those geese are so freaking nice. Yeah. Get yourself one of those geese. Yes, sir. Also, just kind of FYI, we're making some stuff for hunting. Yeah. We're making a hunting, it's not just some stuff, we're making a hunting line. Yeah, like a bunch of stuff. Yeah, so when you roll out in hunting season, you can do it wearing American-made gear. We'll keep you posted on that. Yep. What else? Uh, you said the boots, jeans, there's some wallets, and cool accessories on there. And I, and I accessories. went. Accessories. Yeah, t- you, you make it sound like that, but like, look at the belt. You won't be like yeah. accessories. You'll be like, oh, that I'm getting that belt. Check. I'm getting that wallet. Check. The wallet's kind of a minimalist wallet, though. Mm-hmm. So if you're not into minimalist wallets, then you know maybe there's just a, stick with I think the belt. there's a Maximus wallet too, not Maximus, but there's a more more uh, robust. Robust. There you go. All right, there you go. With the vocab coming in hot. <laughs> just trying to help. I'm just trying to. Help. Nonetheless, a lot of good stuff on there. All made in America. Um, and and good quality stuff. So it's like from top to bottom. That's kind of the go-to when you think about it. So yeah, originusa.com. Also, Jocko did I say jockofuel.com? I didn't. Jockofuel.com. If you want that, if you want that, uh, the the supplement side yeah. of the house. Jockofuel.com. Jockofuel.com. All good. Um. Yeah. But yeah, Jocko has a store as well. That's where you can get discipline equals freedom stuff, shirts, apparel, shirts, hats, hoodies. Hats. Hoodies are back in. Mm-hmm. It's winter. <laughs> it's kind of colder here. And know? then there's the shirt locker, which brief description, shirt locker, what do you got? It is a creative, um, let's just, okay, but on the basic level, it's one, a new shirt every month. Okay. But the designs are a little bit different, a little bit more. There are more layers to the designs, you know. They're funner, uh, I guess. Remember when Jocko podcast? There was a whole thing about like layers. Yes. <laughs> there is still a whole thing There's about still layers. There's a whole thing about layers. Yep. It's almost like it's just the underground. It's part of it. Yep. Just sure. layers. Yep. So there's layers in the t-shirts. Yep. There's more to it than just a straightforward yeah. design. If you listen, you know. If you listen. If you listen, you know. If you're yep. in the game, you know what's up. Exactly. If you're exactly not, you'll be right. like, oh yeah. But if you could do. Yeah, so that's the whole thing about the layers for, as far as layers go. <laughs> look, if you're not in the game, you look at the design, you'd be like, oh, man, that's cool. Yeah. And I get a cool one every month. Cool. But if you listen and you know, you know the other layers in it. So now you get the cool design on the front end, but then you get the you know the, the meaning, the addition. The addition. The back end. So all good. Check that out. It's on JockoStore.com. Hey, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, also subscribe to Jocko Unraveling, rolling out some Christmas cheer with my boy DC, talking about all kinds of lovely subjects. Oh, yeah, hell yeah. Um, Grounded podcast, we got the Warrior Kid podcast. Also, you can join the underground. Speaking of underground, JockoUnderground.com. We got a, a little something that we had to set up just in case tyrannical forces take over. Mm-hmm. We got to have a place to go. We got a place to go. It's called Jock Underground, jockunderground.com. If you want to help us in there, if you want to help us be ready for any contingencies that might unfold, you can subscribe. It's $8.18 a month. We got an additional little podcast on there. We answer your questions and whatnot. If you can't afford it, it's cool. We still want you in the game. Go to assistance at underground, jockunderground.com. Assistance at jockunderground.com. There you go. It's true. Also, we have a YouTube channel mm-hmm. for the video version of this podcast. Some excerpts on there mm-hmm. and some also some additional content, <laughs> as it were. You're going to have to check it out to see what it is. But, yeah, every once in a while we'll put some additional stuff on there that, that turns out to be interesting. You want to see what Jocko uh, can't live without? Get that kind of video sometimes. There you go. Um, psychological Warfare, MP3 tracks to keep you on the path we got flipsidecanvas.com dakota meyer selling stuff to hang on your wall we got books only cry for the living mentioned it today it's holly mckay's first book we covered on podcast number 271 you can get that from jockopublishing.com jockopublishing.com this is actually a book 
that I published. Why? Because it's a freaking epic story from somebody that spent time on the battlefield when ISIS was being fought and pushed back. And she interviewed people from ISIS, which is crazy. So if you want to check that out, you can go to jockopublishing.com. Also, final spin. It's a story. It's a novel. It's a poem. It's a manuscript. It's a freaking wild emotional ride. Don't read it when you're in front of people because you might be crying. Don't read it when you got to be quiet because you might be laughing. Final spin. I wrote it. Leadership strategy and tactics. Field manual. The code, the evaluation, the protocols. Discipline, freedom, field manual. Warrior kid. One, two, three, and four. That's the Christmas gift. Mm-hmm. That's the Christmas gift. Mm-hmm. You're wondering, oh, I want to get this little kid. Yeah, that's the gift. Yeah. Get him the get him all books, all books. War, Way of the Warrior Kid, one, two, three, and four. There is no better gift you can get for a kid than those books. If you got a little kid, get him Mikey and the Dragons. Mm-hmm. Little Mikey and the Dragons. Let him learn to overcome fear. About Face by Colonel David Hackworth. I wrote the forward on the new version and then extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership. Who I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. Speaking of Leif, we have a leadership consultancy. If you need help inside your organization from a leadership perspective, which if you have any issues inside your organization, whatever problems you have, they're leadership problems. Mm -hmm. Leadership is the solution. Go to echelonfront.com for that. If you want to come to one of our live, live events, you can check it out there. We also have the online training academy, extremeownership.com. It's an online leadership training academy. You can bring your team in there. You can get everyone aligned. You can get your whole company engaged in that. Or you can just do it yourself. But you don't become a good leader overnight. And you don't, you're not just born a good leader. Just like you're not born a good guitar player. You're not. I don't care who you are. You gotta pick up and practice and learn. That's what the academy's for. Pick up, practice, learn for leadership. Go to extremeownership.com. You wanna ask me a question? I'm there. You can literally just sit there and talk to me. Three times a week, two or three times a week, I'm there answering questions. Live. So check that out, extremeownership.com. If you wanna help service members active and retired, their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a Incredible charity organization. If you want to donate to that, or you want to get involved, she is helping so many veterans. Go to America's Mighty Warriors.org. And if you want any more of my looming lectures or you need more of Echo's random retorts, you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on the gram, on Facebook. Echo's at Echo Charles. I'm at Jock Wink. Holly is on Instagram, on Twitter. She's Holly S. McKay. Also, hollymckay.com. That's where you can find her sub stack as well, where people, it's a new uh, method of putting information out there. The sub stack. Yeah. A lot of journalists are using it. Mm. It's kind of like a Patreon, but it's not being controlled. And they're allowing free speech, which apparently Patreon was not. Substack. Substack. It's cool. Finally, um, thanks to Holly. You can hear uh, what she does, the risks she takes to inform and educate the world. So thank you, Holly, for doing that. People, people who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. And someone has to uncover history. I liked what she said about history, history, rough draft, the rough draft of history. Mm. So someone's got to go out and grab that information. People like Holly that go and do that. Thank you, Holly, for your hard work and bravery to make that happen. And to people in uniform out there, thank you for doing your best to confront and stop evil in the world and keep us all safe. And that includes our police and law enforcement. Firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all first responders. Thank you for keeping us safe right here at home. And everyone else out there, there is evil in the world and there is good. And we have to be on guard and we have to be vigilant. 
vigilant against evil, vigilant against corruption. These thoughts and ideas can creep from person to person and from mind to mind like a disease. So stay vigilant, stay prepared, tell the truth, look out for each other. And and try and keep your part of the world. Try and make your part of the world as good as you can and help other people do the same. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko.